year's truck that we paid the bill for this year. So the 140 will be next year. Um, and then the mini excavator, we had planned to buy a new mini excavator. We've actually changed our thinking. Um, we're going to rent an excavator for a short amount of time because our one excavator is used for pulling sidewalks. We use the second one to do some ditching and other work. Um, so we'll spend, we think, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars on that. But this ninety-five substantially will be left unspent. So that can go to the capital fund and help to fix some of that deficit and be there for future years. Um, <coughs> quarry trailer was was a budget eighty-five hundred. We'll spend every nickel of that. We we made some expenses the second quarter, but it's all spent in the third, and that's the trail where we use to spread chloride when we grade roads to keep the dust down. Mm -hmm. um, was that broken earlier this year? It was built. Okay. So we, we bought the trailer, and then we had to buy the the, the pipe, the, the equipment to spread the chloride, and so Public Works essentially hand-built that. Okay. Um, and they built it, and it, yeah, it took a little while to get the bugs worked out. Yeah. <coughs> and um, audience members is upset about that. Yes. Um, cemetery vehicle, we didn't spend it in the second quarter. We did in the third. We bought a little Greenworks side-by-side -side vehicle. Um, cemetery wants that. Um, Public Works will also use it, and Parks will use it quite a bit. Um, talk to the, to the disc golf group, for example, and we talked about now they do a lot of annual maintenance and spreading of wood chips and things like that in the past, and so that's a perfect little vehicle for, for those sort of jobs. <coughs> um, recreation CIP, I'm sure we'll have a surplus there. Um, 12,000 of that is the pool study, which Alec is, is actively working on. Um, he's talked to most towns that have pools and have done renovations mm -hmm. of late. He's taken some site visits, um, kind of having to do some of that with Katarina. Um, and we'll, we'll go from there and, and see what he, what he comes up with. Um, and aside from the, the soccer field, um, our playing fields generally weren't damaged by the, by the flood. Some work that the flood, you know, some work the volunteers can help us. The pavilion down there is pretty dirty and needs to be cleaned. Um, but in general, we came through okay. That's great. Uh, uh, so that's good. Um, and then the scuba system was a planned capital purchase. Um, Gary ordered that. Um, the bill came through in the third quarter, so you'll see that next. So the capital budget, budget, the capital expenses will go from substantially unspent to pretty much entirely spent mm -hmm. by the time I do this report next. I have a question. <coughs> Thinking back up to the cemetery, is there mm -hmm. concern long term about this part of the budget? Yeah. Cemetery has run a, the cemetery fund has run a deficit for a long time. Um, and they get $15,000 of taxpayer funds. That has to increase. Um, and the reality of cemeteries is that there, there are maintenance responsibility and perpetuity. Um, it's nice to have that investment fund, and they've got a pretty substantial amount. Um, How are plots selling? <coughs> Plots are, plots are fine. Um, the challenge is maintenance of the cemeteries and finding people to do that work, and, and we're subject to all those inf same inflationary pressures. The other challenge is John Woodruff, who's been the board chair for years, um, and gets an extra stipend because he does the administrative work that goes with recording deeds and, and, and all those issues. Um, it's not going to do it forever, so we've got to find a staff person to do that at some point. So I, I can see our cemetery expenses in the next three years um, going up over 30000 Wouldn't surprise me. So that warrants us, you know, really like a special part of a meeting with, you know, with John. Is John, is that right? John. And us and, you know, thinking about the future, like, percentages that should come out of the reserve fund percentages yeah. that we should raise, et cetera. I don't in talking to John who's been who's been the head of commi the commission for a long time, I don't think he's ever gone to a select board meeting <laughs> to have that conversation. But yeah, I think we need to have it. Um, because there is a balance about how much they should keep in their fund, mm -hmm. which which I think they view <clears throat> as large capital 
things if they want to mm -hmm. put in a new decorative wrought iron fence somewhere that's a really expensive project um, we might view it a little bit differently and worry about the maintenance costs so yeah i think that's a conversation like a we should have the budget time yeah and i think a similar issue for the library the library has a half million dollar investment fund my knowledge of the history is that when this building was built the library pledged to fundraise for a portion, a portion of it and they part of that pledge was they said to the select board if we don't meet our fundraising targets our investment fund will be yours um, hmm. they met the target <coughs> so they've got this investment fund <coughs> and i said to that board you should come up with a plan for the use of it Typically, these things are used for capital projects. You've got a new building. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, similar conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so with them, it's it's not as pressing. Mm -hmm. and, and historically, the library budget has, it's much bigger. It's over a half million dollars in taxpayer funds. So they've been sort of afforded the same increases year to year that the rest of the town has. They've also but, just done that visioning and strategic planning. So it could be simple enough as saying, you know, when you revisit that strategic plan, which whatever, it's usually like three to five years, we would really like for this to be a part of that. Yeah. So it's not as imminent, but if we can say, you know, we recommend it being part of that next strategic plan, but with the cemetery, it feels like. It's a little more imminent yeah. and a little more pressing. How much is the, the price of a plot for the cemetery? <clears throat> I don't know offhand, it's, it's not expensive. Mm -hmm. um, it, what I, when I heard the number, I just, I knew a couple of numbers in my head from, from mm -hmm. other people who've been buried in, you know, New Jersey. So the price of a plot is really expensive. Um, a lot more people there. A lot more people there, a lot less space. Yeah. Um, Nationwide, isn't the issue that the plots aren't selling uh, at, at the former rate? Because the plots aren't selling. Um, there's, um, yeah, plots aren't selling. There's very few burials. Mm -hmm. So right, like nationally, cemeteries are going out of business and so going mm -hmm. into, into default. So, and when they when a cemetery runs out of money, it, by default, it becomes town property. Fuck yes. <laughs> <laughs> or a reason to have a proactive conversation. Mm -hmm. And don't forget to ask Keith for that one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions on the second quarter budget? Thank you. Um, Thank you. Oh, sorry, one only because the auditor asked. All of those vehicle expenses that were different years, mm -hmm. are they, um, he mentioned offhand, be posting back and whatnot. Is that what you do for that? Or at this point now? I just, That's it not, struck me that he said that and then you were presenting it in this way. The vehicles are not posted back to, to prior years. They're, they're when you make, when you write the check. Um, and that's a challenge in managing the capital budgets is you, know, you budget 91 year, 140, right. the, you know, 141 year, 100 the next, and pay the bills as they come One in. Right right now. So you, it's not uncommon to, to run a deficit one year or a big surplus knowing that that's going to be accounted for in the next. Um, but the magnitude of our deficit in the capital fund is much larger than that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if we're ready to move on, let's discuss the uh, agenda for uh, September 5th. We've all agreed to meet on Tuesday. Yeah. I might be a little late, like five, ten minutes, but I can make it work. Okay. Oh, I cannot. And I think I... Oh, wait. Yes, I can. <laughs> it's my work board meeting, but I'm pretty sure we're going to um, postpone it. And I had said this before, but I, I might be able to be here. So that's confusing, but have the meeting, and I might right. be here. Sorry. Mike, you uh, available the 5th of uh, September? Yes, I am. If I'm, if I'm off to run, so I can drive down. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I, you, know, you know, when you're doing narcotics, <laughs> I don't want to do anything illegal. You're not supposed to drive. We, oh, we appreciate yeah. that. Yep. Your devotion to public safety is honorable. Oh, 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 oh. I'll tell you, I don't feel any, any altered state by being on oxycodone. Yeah, you don't sound it either. 
But it doesn't affect your judgment. I have a completely perfect personality. All right. Okay. Well, Struck from the well, back. Thank you. Well, Thanks well. for that update. Um, <laughs> Alyssa, how are you feeling? Good. I am, I am tired now. I, 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 You're not alone. Me too. Me too. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, don't necessarily hit the bottom again. Oh, this ten. God damn. All right. Uh, let's move forward. Uh, what do we got on the agenda? For I don't have the draft agenda in front of me, unfortunately. I don't, I don't know that we got this far ahead. I think our yeah, imminent <coughs> concern was when Karen was away, and so right. we planned these two. Well, we we survived so far. Uh, so I would suggest. Um, the agenda should include schedule your schedule your by this time next meeting Karen will be back mm -hmm. she can talk to the school if there's a desire the for a charter vote date mm -hmm. schedule that um, and updates basically. and it could be that September 5th could be your first public hearing mm -hmm. uh -huh. to, to coincide with the meeting since you've got that 70 day rule. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Got to talk to Karen, make sure we can advertise that, get that all done. But I think that's an awkward date to have a public meeting on such an important topic right during a major, you know, holiday weekend. Yeah, but that's mm -hmm. my thought. Yeah, but it's the day. We're hemmed in by the 70 day rule. I, I, I know we're, we're stuck with time. And, and it may be that a charter vote would, you know, if we if we were kicking off the 70 days today, we're October 30th. If we're delaying two weeks, we're mid-November. So it may well be that after talking to the school, Karen might suggest a date in early in December, in early December, depending on. Oh, that's cutting it close. It's cutting it close. There's no way, I think, to not cut it close. But even if we have the public hearing on the fifth, we can still we're, we are still able to have other public meetings regarding the charter right. between. So that can be the kickoff, but it doesn't mean it's the last one where people oh you know, don't get to weigh in, you know. Are we resolved on sentence two? No, that's no question. I think enough. I didn't know. But in the next two weeks, we can do that in the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. I would suggest if we can't resolve sentence two, we can eliminate right, sentence yeah. two. And yeah. yeah, I'm not glued to it if it needs to be eliminated so that we can pass this measure, then eliminate it. But we would want to work on that um, pol policy for spending allocation. Yeah, what I heard from Tom and Teresa was that we've got the framework. They want to see a little more flesh on the bone, and we can do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can work on that and send it around and get some input before the next meeting. Perfect. Sure. Great. Um, I have to believe that there's other things that we had planned to talk no, about. I was that, say. Uh, maybe we don't have them in front of us right now, so uh, I can. I, will, uh, I can deliver that. Um, oh yeah. Committee stuff. All right. Stuff. Committee stuff. Okay. The actual committee structure. structure. That's what I want. Committee structure. That's we can call it that. Um, and just to say, I didn't get into it at that point, but the two, um, I'll talk with you after, Danny, just mm -hmm. to say this, lessons learned from six weeks on research in tropical storm <coughs> rain that was done by two UVM students is just like a really good outline um, okay. that we like could re structure. replicate. And they have three guiding questions and they talked about all the forms cool. they used, which is what you already talked about, yeah. like the 11 stakeholder interviews. They did do a public forum for public input. Cool. They had a survey, which I don't know that we need, but just to say like, yeah. If for consistency, if nothing else, it's interesting to revisit, and it's a good framework. Um, and that also is really a cane, you get one too, um, to the Long Term Recovery Steering Committee after Ooh, action yes. report, which I would love that analogous that. to be on top yes. of this new one. Anyway, and if maybe a printer or a printed website, version, yeah. I, whatever you want to throw at me. It's all on the website, but yes, I can say it's a which website? Who's our <coughs> librarybt.com. It's on our website, yes, just like link it. And I don't know if this would be a good item for September 5th to pull from the parking lot, but um, our police contract expires June 30th of next year. We'll need to renegotiate that. That'll take some time. I was intending to engage with the state police in a couple months. Um, I don't know if you wanted to have a public safety state police contract agenda item before then to talk about getting the public feedback, what's working, what's not. 
I get a lot of feedback on the state police contract, but it's from a handful of people. Right. I mean, it'll be that as well, but yeah, it's worth <coughs> putting out. I don't know about timing. Agreed. Yeah, I, uh, I think we should pull it up. We may have to visit it again, but uh, sounds like we may have a fairly light agenda, so why not? Let's pull it up. And just dump it up. Just dump it up. Well, I mean, we updated. Oh, um, I did talk with Dan Sweet today. Uh, he said he was going to be talking with his listers about uh, how they're going to deal with uh, uh, depreciation of uh, flood affected housing. <coughs> and that uh, he may have an update. I don't know if he'll have it for uh, September 5th or not. Um, I don't know. I talked to Dan um, and I talked to Bob Butler at some point. He was one of the listers. And you know, the, the challenge is that, you know, you're really supposed to reflect the market. Um, right. And we don't have any data yet, and so we're going to go back and look at what was done post-Irene and try to determine how much of it was, was really data-driven. And, we will, and the, the consultant who helped us then, the Dan Suite, is not working for us around, but still actively working. Mm -hmm. um, but how much of it was data-driven and how much of it was a little bit more sentiment driven. Yeah. Um, and the good news is, is that this this would impact the future grand list, which is set as of April thirtieth. Um, but it's really, it's really as of the day you bill your taxes. So we've essentially got ten months to, to work on that and reach some solution if there's any depreciation applied. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what they found post Irene was they applied depreciation to properties, reduced their grand list values, and the market essentially ignored Irene. Right. And, and and what I've said to Dan is it's it's an obvious and easy sentiment to say, well, sure, we should depreciate everything X percent. They were flooded out. Um, but we're in this really unusual housing market right now, um, and I'm just. I think everyone should be convinced of the impact <laughs> uh, before we automatically depreciate things. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's an impact, great, we'll follow the data. Um, mm -hmm. But we, we should, I think they're going to take their time and develop some sort of a good methodology to get there. Okay. So we don't necessarily want to watch that for the fifth. <clears throat> the other, just a little, since you mentioned Dan, the other little update is um, the, the reappraisal process is a bit changed. It was based previously in your common level of appraisal. So once your values were um, more than 20% away from the market, you had to reappraise. The state also publishes something um, that in effect is your, your confidence interval around that, and now it's also based on that. And so we, we have another year before we've got to formally start the process. Um, and even then, it's a year, it's likely a year before the state notifies us we have to start the process, and then we have some time to get it done. So we're potentially a couple of years away from reappraisal. I thought the state wanted to take this on itself. <coughs> uh, they, the, the bill they that was in a bill, the bill they wound up passing was they're going to study taking it on themselves. I think it makes, I think it's eminently reasonable for the state to take it on themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I hope they do that someday. Um, from our perspective, we have almost $200,000 in a reappraisal fund, um, and we have ARPA funds devoted to it. So I, I think I can confidently tell you, maybe not today, but come budget time, that that $200,000 in ARPA fund could be set to a different purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay. If that makes sense. That was my question, is what would your offhand recommendation in terms of, is there a strategy for doing it, or is it a strategy to delay because the state is likely to do it in the ARPA, which you just said? So a number of towns um, are looking for appraisers, right? They're looking for firms to do the work, and they just don't exist. Um, I think our strategy might be a little different, and I think our strategy might be to acknowledge that the professional services firms are not out there and to 
hire someone as an employee to work under Dan's tutelage. To, Dan would do the training, and then that person would do a substantial amount of the field work overseen by Dan. Um, a couple people we have in mind that, that do a little bit of work for other towns uh, that might step into the role. But I think that might be a better approach um, than hiring firms when we know they don't exist. Maybe things will change in the next year or two. I mean, the, you know, the, the free market abhors a vacuum, and right now there's a big vacuum of people of listers. So. Uh, there's a profit margin there if you want to get that business, so right. that might change. Public works update had been a potential one that didn't work with the yeah, one really well. <coughs> well, that's probably falling asleep uh, before we uh, um, conclude. <coughs> Sorry, I said public works had been with Katarina, and I don't think work was scheduling. Do we want it in the I would suggest after Wait. September 5th because Great. if we give it until about October, the, the summer paving, most of the summer work will be done. Excellent. Give us a better update. Okay. Maybe foreshadow 2024 projects. Mm -hmm. All right. um, and uh, then uh, I'll meet with. Uh, Karen, when she gets back, and we can take a look and see if she has anything on her draft agenda, and uh, I'll uh, we'll try to rough out what we just went through, plus whatever she's got, and we'll get that out to you. Uh, when is she back? End of the week. Um, forget if it's end of the week or Monday, but okay. it's three weeks. She's in three. Okay, by the end of next week. All right. Uh, any Oh, Any other business? Yeah, I board? just wanted to say before we conclude, I would like to apologize to the board for using expletive <laughs> when discussing tipped wage workers. <laughs> <laughs> Technically breaking decorum. <laughs> Policy is just, just blame it on the drugs. <laughs> Strike from the record. We gotta get out of here. <laughs> Wrap it up. I'll move to it. Okay, y'all. Thank you. Second day. I'm there. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Seven o'clock, uh, I'm calling to order this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board on Monday, the August uh, 21st of August. And the first item on our agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Uh, second. All right, any discussion? Um, we should take the minutes off because they didn't get circulated off of consent before the meeting, but I'll send them after. Okay. Uh, so if I understand it, the uh, motion is to accept the minutes, uh, accept the uh, agenda with uh, the minutes to appear at the following meeting. Okay. Any further discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank Thanks, you, Michael. Aye. Hope you're doing well. Any? Surviving. <laughs> That's the better than the alternative. Um, yes. Uh, any opposed? <laughs> any abstentions? The agenda is approved as amended. Um, next is the consent agenda. The minutes have been struck. Uh, the rest of it is items uh, B through F. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve the consent agenda items. Second. All right, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 There's a slight <laughs> um, Any opposed? Any abstentions? Consent agenda is approved. Now we have the public session. Uh, this is uh, for any items not on the warned agenda. I invite any members of the public to uh, come up and uh, please keep your comments to three minutes or less if you can. Anyone from the public? We are moving through with some alacrity <laughs> tonight. Um, next, we have the introduction of Katerina, our new rec director. Here, Schneider, Master O'Neill, and Mateo Roos. Thank you. <laughs> Got everybody admitted. Katerina, can you come forward? Yep. 
Um, hi, everyone. Have a seat. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for joining us as uh, Rec Director. Would you mind just giving us a little bit of the background and uh, your motivation for joining the team as a uh, Rec Director? Absolutely. Um, so I joined the Recreation Department a little over a month ago. Um, I was interested in the position, um, having worked in government for the last decade plus, um, and wanting to sort of venture into direct service, into the role. I have a, a lot of personal experience in recreation, but most of my other, my professional experience has been in human services and education. Um, so looking to sort of blend those two, build um, community engagement, um, and look into defining recreation pretty broadly so that we can bring people together. Great. And I just want to say, um, you hear a lot in, in today's world that it's hard to find employees and you're lucky if people apply. For this job, I had a lot of people apply. Mm -hmm. And I was really glad that uh, Katarina took the job. Um, I had her whole first week planned out, none of which happened. <laughs> um, but we had some, she jumped right into some real challenges um, and did great. So I'm really happy and excited to have her and I think um, I think a lot of our challenges we've had of late are simply going to vanish. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> awesome. So I really look forward to working with her. Thank you all. Thanks. Great. Welcome. Any questions from the board here? No. All right. Well, as you know, I'm the. You know, I'll be serving as liaison to the rec committee. Uh, we had a good meeting last Thursday night. Uh, I think that they're going to be taking a look at uh, some of the recommendations from the SE group of the two parks, as well as other uh, things that have already been on their agenda in terms of projects moving forward. So we'll be looking at what could be done differently uh, going into uh, the end of this year, and then uh, what's going to be on the budget for 2024. Okay, All right, thank you, Katarina. Appreciate your coming. Yeah. And welcome. Next on the agenda, we have update on the bylaw rewrite. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Martha Stotkis, uh, from uh, chair of the uh, Planning Commission, was not able to join us because they are meeting every Monday night now uh, to get the rewrite completed in time, uh, along with a presentation uh, to by the SE group, uh, which I think is slotted for the uh, 5th of October, to uh, do a first public session. Uh, but. Uh, Alyssa, you've been following this more closely? Yes, so. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get the presentation. I didn't have a chance. Okay. I can keep on talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did see uh, a, a early version of this, and it's sort of exciting that uh, the SE group, uh, whom we have uh, contracted, to engage the public on the, uh, to get public input on the rewrite of the bylaws for uh, phase one, which concerns the village area. I've already done a storyboard, which I believe is what uh, Alyssa is pulling up. Uh, I'm doing that without my whole email. It's just a moment, so give me one sec. All right, yeah, I'll explain all the We're well ahead. We're going to gloss over it. Um, but yeah, uh, and so um, you know they've developed uh, a uh, framework to better understand where we were with the uh, bylaws, what our current bylaws are, and uh, how this new bylaw is being approached, uh, and then uh, a plan to get the uh, public better informed, uh, more involved. And so that uh, we hope to have these bylaws in place for the town meeting uh, 2024, which will be the first Tuesday in March. A couple more digits. Two more digits. <laughs> wow. Uh, I'm, I apologize. This is not a effective way to be doing this. And here we are. So good. Nine seven five eight. 
I think Roger really hit all the high points. I guess it's just saying, you know, we know we have something. Um, tonight we're doing the presentation to the public on the charter, but just saying again, recognizing for the bylaw rewrite that's upcoming and just making sure that the select board is aware of it. One of the things we know with zoning regulations is that they can be candidly dense and technical and knowing what that means as a property owner and resident in Waterbury, what a proposed change means about what you can do with your property um, was a really important part. So we actually um, have some additional funding um, from the state that's helping us to hire SE Group to help do visualizations to talk about where this is actually happening, um, what it means for your property and people to be able to get additional updates. Um, and also talk about there's look like walking tours um, to again actually see examples because it can also be very esoteric and kind of like you know your side yard setback is seven feet what does that mean what does that look like there's a lot of housing that already exists in Waterbury but one of the reasons that we need to do an update is because although it already exists in Waterbury and we love it it technically might not be allowed under our regulations right now on the books just because they're outdated um, and so folks just understanding what that actually looks like on the ground um, again I think the big thing is shout out um, public hearings again the point being that this would be early have time for folks to provide feedback um, and then actually get to the public hearings ahead of town meeting uh, like Roger alternated um, I think that's really it. Again, there will be a survey making sure that's coordinated so people understand what it's about. Um, the big thing for the select board, anything else? Um, uh, one of the only gaps that came up for us was just talking about um, the potential for industrial is one of the current zoning districts, so where Pilgrim Park is currently. Mm -hmm. That district right now does not allow housing. In general, thinking like you're doing industrial, it's big, heavy, messy, you know, hypothetically, if we were to have that type of use in town, which we really don't. Um, so historically, that has not been something that allows housing. One of the things the Planning Commission is considering is allowing that, recognizing that some folks have said, well, this is an area in our downtown where potentially housing could go. Um, so just one request we had is if folks on the board feel like they have strong feelings either way on that proposal, to let the Planning Commission know. Because again, the goal is that we're on the same page as the Planning Commission. Um, if we have you know, <coughs> preferences one way or the other, they know sooner so that they can be proposing stuff that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, my, my impression is that we're not envisioning putting in a concrete plant or anything like that uh, in that area. Uh, that uh, uh, I could envision housing uh, in, that, uh, in that zone, uh, and housing is, of course, a need. I would agree, verbatim. And Alyssa, I don't want to stir the pot, but I'm just curious how the conversations have been changing, knowing that we're on this tight line, but also with the flood and thinking about you know mitigation and how that's changing you know, or impacting conversations with their weekly meetings now. Good question. Um, I can't speak specifically to the most recent planning commission meetings. I would say I certainly, as a select board member, have received comments to the extent of saying, is this changing things? Mm -hmm. um, I guess understanding and part of the public outreach will be understanding what flood, flood regulations we have in place right now that are going to still be in case. And I guess the point I would just make is that not all of the downtown is in the 100 year floodplain. So I think having a conversation about <clears throat> increasing density and housing in the downtown does not always automatically mean that it might be in the floodplain. I'm not denying it might be in some cases, but I think um, they're not mutually exclusive in every case. Mm -hmm. And uh, do either you or Tom know, uh, supposing it is in the floodplain, uh, are there rigs uh, for building above the floodplain, like uh, they've done uh, at the com state complex, or you know, just putting things up on pier, perhaps putting parking underneath? Uh, we don't have our 2016 select board member, though Chris is in the audience. I'm fairly sure we require two feet above 100-year um, uh -huh. floodplain elevation currently on the books. That, from 2016. That's my recollection too, having looked into it a little bit for Stanley Wasson. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Is that okay? Yeah. Sure. Uh, Pilgrim Park, are you talking about the Pilgrim Park area? Is it for sale? No. No. All right, so, but we're talking about it? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Actually, yeah. a little more context. Um, it was just a general conversation about for the zoning update, 
Right. We don't have a lot of industrial land in Waterbury in general. No, right. It's one of the few also. places. No, but the, the, the owner could add more development there. There's more room there. Yeah, so. possibly. Mm -hmm. But right, but yes, it's not allowed by the current or any future owner of exactly. any type right now. Okay. Any further questions? Chris? If there were changes in the zoning regs that allow housing in an industrial area, um, what are the possibilities that could handcuff proposals for industrial uh, ventures down the road as far as if there were housing put in, mm -hmm. what kind of objections could be forced on this industrial proposal when in fact we, it, it is what little bit of industrial area we have. I'm just wondering right. would it make it difficult <clears throat> if somebody had an industrial proposal uh, and if you were to have a housing structure there or structures, you know, what kind of pushback might you get from those residents or would the zoning regs preclude that from happening if it was still designated as an industrial area? That's a good question. Melissa? Totally. So, well, I guess one, I just want to be clear. This is something the Planning Commission is talking about. So all the, the Planning Commission has this type of conversation in detail. The only reason I flag this for the select board is because this is one that feels like it might go to that higher level. It's a bigger change. But all of the ongoing work the Planning Commission does is really about, is about every type of use. It's saying, like, do you want to allow a restaurant in my residential neighborhood on South Main Street? Do you want to add, allow a museum and at what square footage? Like, truly, this is like the level of detail and things. Um, candidly, Chris, I think what you're kind of outlining is the reason the current status quo exists. So the current status quo has said, if you're doing a lot of uses <laughs> allowed in industrial, that often is considered incompatible with housing for reasons like noise and mitigation. The reason the Planning Commission has started having this conversation is because they were saying, we recognize that may, someone may say, it's a bad idea. Again, what I'm going to say, yeah, I have no interest. There's trucks in the area. I don't want to do that. But right now, they have no option because they can't even propose anything at all because it's just not allowed. The answer is just, that's not allowed. You need to look elsewhere in Waterbury. Um, the conversation about what how uses are regulated in general, how much noise, what hours of operation, things like that, um, would all be part of like what those industrial uses are. Um, so that's a separate conversation. It came up in part in practice because handedly many of the uses there, folks felt like currently weren't incompatible with having housing. You know, there wasn't, as Roger was like joking, you know, a more serious, you know, concrete, it tends just our current breakdown right now in water rate is more like light industry where minimal exterior impacts. Um, so hear what you're saying in that we certainly don't want to create a scenario that's going to set folks up for failure down the road. And just to say, I think that's the conversation the Planning Commission is having to, to make that, to say, do we make that call preemptively as a town and say, we're just going to not allow it. We don't even want to have the conversation. Or do we say, we're going to say that you could consider proposing housing it still might need to go through a town permitting process that would weigh, you know, standard development review. But again, right now, in certain areas of town, we can't even start the conversation because it's not allowed, which is why they brought it up. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Um, so as I understand it, they're going to continue working on these and uh, have a presentation on Thursday, uh, the 5th of October, 5 o'clock. And so questions such as courses can be brought forward at that time. Or any of their meetings. If you want to, oh, they're probably not, but they're, they're meeting at 7 on Monday, so like folks want to run over genuinely to the library and share this. Yeah. 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 So as he grew, what is their role now? Yeah. Is it marketing? Because to me, what you, I just heard was they're reaching out to the public. Mm -hmm. So we, we got a state grant to hire an engineering firm to do public Public really outreach, mostly like the visuals. So as I talked about, like what we have is something like so a 40. Are they driving the planning or is planning driving what they need to do? 
the planning group and Tom can speak to, but they have a scope of work with SE group. SE group is just providing, the planning commission is volunteers. They're providing essentially assistance. They're being compensated, paid for their work to do visuals and create a website to help with what the planning commission proposed. But the planning commission makes the policy. Okay, I got it now. So if the statement of work that drives this activity is aligned to the schedule you just put on them, okay. So this will not be another my understanding of the bylaws is this has been a marathon times two. Yep. This, you showed 2019, but that's not the correct date. I mean, it's been going on for a while. So I, I guess my comment would be this will be the final bylaw rewrite, but you just said it's phase one. What's phase two? The phases have to do with the geographic constraints the area right now that they're defining is everything in the town of Waterbury between the Winooski River and the interstate, 89. If you drop those down on a map, okay. that's so what they're doing. the line to e or anything is a geographic. Correct, area. correct. Okay. It does, in practice, I will say, cover much of yeah. the downtown and much of EFA, but not entirely. And it's a good clarification because when we talk about industrial, I talked about the industrial in this area. There's little bits elsewhere, you know, down here on Route 2 and things like that that are also industrial. I see a hand up uh, there, but I can't read the name. It's Mike. Oh, it's Mike? Mike. Come oh, yes. Here. Okay, do you hear me? Loud, Loud and clear. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, sorry, for some reason, I don't understand why my video is not on. It says it's on, but there's, there's no video. But um, my question has to do with something that we, we haven't touched on for a while, but we've talked about, you know, in the past, is Airbnbs and other, uh, you know, accessory kind of, kind of dwellings. I know I had a conversation with Harry Sanderson, the public works director in Stowe, and he said they're having, they're saying it's gonna be a real crisis in their community because they said there were probably a thousand Airbnb units, and it's not the typical Airbnb unit that we associate someone, <laughs> they'll pay the taxes, you know, it's more the out-of-state investors who are coming up buying properties and converting properties into Airbnbs. That they're kind of taking properties, you know, out of, you know, single-family residential, you know, coffers. Uh, to me, that's a real good time. You know, I don't think we have any kind of the numbers like, like, like Stowe does, a thousand. But I know our numbers of Airbnbs over the last you know, five years or so have been increasing. And I know the DRB has kind of looked for some more guidance on how how we're gonna deal with Airbnbs as a matter of course in our community. And I'm curious if anyone has some, something to say where, where, where do we wanna make a policy statement on that as a select board or what? Alyssa. I think you hit the head on the, Words. <laughs> We're using a hammer to hit a nail on the head, I think. Um, it is what you said, Mike, which is we have to as a select board. So just to say the Planning Commission's position, particularly as it pertains to this rewrite, right now we don't define short-term use like an Airbnb anywhere in our regulations. In the rewrite, they will right. define it as a use, so we would hypothetically be able to regulate it but they are not proposing any changes as part of the rewrite, recognizing it's its own whole big thorny issue. And they are referring to, if we on the select board want to do something different, but just to answer for the bylaw rewrite, it is defining it, but not making any changes. We then, as you said, as a select board, could have a conversation about if we wanted to do something separate outside of that. And is this on the agenda? Of Thanks, the... Thanks Oh, sorry, Mike. Um, is this on the agenda of the uh, Housing Task Force? I was just saying, and in fact, on Thursday, we went through Air DNA, and do you know the numbers offhand? You were looking at some of the data. Okay. Um, the Air DNA numbers for the state of Vermont, I don't have another book. Hold on. <laughs> uh, the Air DNA numbers are just the, the sole number of. Do, 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 I don't have it written down. 
um, the sole number of short-term rentals in Vermont. Um, there was a study conducted in Stowe that looked at short-term rentals and their impact on the town of Stowe as a whole. And nothing was conclusive in regards of whether or not they are taking away long-term rentals or if it's a second homeowner who is renting out their second home during <coughs> summer months or, or what have you. Um, though I share your fervor, my friend, <laughs> um, there isn't anything conclusive to show us other than one chart on AirDNA that shows an upward trajectory of short-term rentals and a slight downtick in long-term rentals, and that last study was done 2021. So we don't have the updated data, but as far as the numbers are concerned, it does look like there is at very least a slight impact on the housing market as a whole. But Stowe's numbers were inconclusive from their study. And the broader answer is yes, it's on our agenda. We're working on updating all of our data, including that, but recognizing, again, you have standard housing units and rental and that this is kind of a separate piece of that. Yeah, Chris. Swanique and I was just having this same conversation about Airbnbs 20 minutes ago before I got here. Mm -hmm. um, is there any benefit to the town if those could be kind of listed under the commercial category uh, from a property tax standpoint to benefit the town? Because clearly, if you think about it, <coughs> long term rentals are for residents. So many Airbnbs, and we have many. I drive by a lot of them all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, one house on Ripley Road just got completely refurbished. They, lift, they jacked the house up, put a foundation under it, turned this thing into a choke beast, and it's strictly Airbnb. Um, so I don't know <coughs> if there's any advantage to us if there's a possibility to label it under commercial because they're they are commercial, they're just like a hotel, motel. Uh, is there any tax benefit to the town? There is not. I don't want to use the word legal, uh, but my understanding is that the framework by which he does his job doesn't allow us to essentially list those as commercial properties. If it's a single family residence that is used as an Airbnb, it's taxed as a single family residence. And I've raised that same issue with him it's really got to be addressed at a higher level than this town to do what you're saying. And perhaps it should be, perhaps that's a conversation that they've had for 10 years, um, at least. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a simple issue. And then if it was commercial, it's a whole another layer of complexity to us valuing those properties. So it's not an easy thing uh, per se, but I've had that conversation many times in house. Well, unfortunately, it's taken us to the cleaners. It's still, a lot of people are benefiting from it, obviously, because it it's subsidizing their, their well, Robert, what I will say is that an 815 is a charter presentation which includes the local option tax, which includes taxes on short-term rentals. So, so, so there could be some benefit yeah. down the road. Yeah, and I think all of us recognize that this is a significant issue. Uh, it's not on the agenda tonight per se, but uh, it is something that the Housing Task Force will be looking at in more detail, and I expect within the next three months we'll be uh, coming up with uh, some sort of way of addressing the issue uh, to a better, a more uh, constructive extent than we have so far. Any other questions on the zoning ranks, the bylaw rewrite? Okay, let's move on to the uh, auditor's presentation. I believe Sullivan Powers and Company has a representative. Are you here? Yeah, please. I can get on the big screen here. Do you mind just stating your name for the record? Sure. Uh, Richard Brigham. I'm the lead partner with the firm of Sullivan Powers and Company. So what I thought I'd do is take us through the audit report and kind of introduce you to it and get you kind of the focus of the different sections of the audit. Um, obviously, there's a lot of information here. I don't know if you've had time to really go through it all, but there's, like I said, there's 64 pages of information 
Um, and we're going to kind of go thumb through some of the sections. A couple of them I'll, I'll <coughs> stop at and kind of give you a, some more information on it. The others I'll blow by relatively quickly because you can look at it on your own, you know, time to kind of figure out if there are other questions that I can answer for you down the road. Um, so if I look at pages one through four, and if you look at those, that is really the actual audit report itself. So this is a financial statement which has all sorts of information based on uh, you know, transactions that have occurred, payroll being paid, warrants being paid, policies being set, all the activities that management, the board, Tom has, has done during the year, has created processes for us to kind of go through it and as auditors come and kind of look at stuff, test transactions, test the analytical uh, data, and try to come up with you know, uh, an opinion so my whole charge here is this four pages is really, that's my goal, is this four pages. And you have really three different choices when you have a, an audit opinion. You have a, what could be an adverse opinion. Financial statements are not fairly stated. I've done those. I've had clients who did that, who have, who have that, those results. We have, sometimes there's a qualified <coughs> opinion. The opinion is fairly stated, except for this, or except for this, or we didn't follow this for this particular reason. Or the, the, uh, the best one to have is obviously an unqualified opinion. That's what the town has achieved in this particular, I think it's actually achieved in all the audits I've been here, but, but um, I always like to congratulate the town on that because, uh, like I said, I do a lot of these presentations and they're not always unqualified opinions. So to get the information that circulates, that gets to the board, that gets to Tom, gets all the information. I, I just want to say that I think the town's done a great job to get to the unqualified opinion. I'm going to just skip through pages five and six, or might come back to those in a minute. But if we look at page seven and eight, so this is what your typical financial statements, if you're looking, you know, you're working on your businesses, this is a balance sheet if we're looking at page seven. So this is a snapshot of time of where your assets and liabilities stood at June 30, or December 31st, 2022. So if you're looking down, you've got your major funds here, and a couple of funds I just wanted to kind of chat about real quickly. If I look down through the general fund, you'll basically see up top, you have your total assets of 2,997, you have your total liabilities of 2,563, plus you've got some deferred inflows of about 129,000. All that basically equates to if you subtract your assets to your liabilities, you get your fund balance. And if we're looking at the fund balance of the general fund, you'll see down there the fund balance for at December 31, 2022 is 303,478. What we tried to do in the footnote there is to outline the pieces of that fund balance and, to, and kind of outline you know, whether they're restricted, committed, assigned, or unassigned. And so kind of going down here, when I look at this, there's a few little small pieces of committed and restricted, which you can go to the footnotes of the financials and find out exactly what they're committed for or what they're restricted for. Um, but the big thing is, is the rest of it, most of your fund balance is being assigned for next year's tax, for, for uh, balancing the budget in the, in the 23 um, financial statements. So that's about 258,150. That leaves you with an unassigned uh, fund balance of about $5,311. $5, That's not a lot of fund balance. And so one of the things, and we've had discussions with Tom, we've had discussions with staff about you know, um, you know, maybe trying to figure out ways to increase the fund balance level. A lot of, uh, every town I go to is different in how much fund balance they want to retain. Whether you know, they want to try to use it to reduce taxes, obviously there's a heavy, uh, following of people that say that's what you want to do. But then, you know, uh, if you go by the GFOA or if you go by other best practices, they want you to build some sort of fund balance for the future to be able to, so that you might have less borrowing, you can do more borrowing from yourself rather than, especially in a time when interest rates are so high. So that's one of the things I, I uh, you know, I think the town should be focused on. I, I had a conversation with, with Tom not too long ago where he talked about, I guess tonight you're talking about uh, a rooms and meals tax, so um, and that would be another way to build up a fund balance to be able to hopefully start putting money aside. And having a, a stronger, healthier fund balance would be 
a great way for you to have more cash flow on hand so you don't have to borrow as much and save on interest costs. Great, what should that unassigned be? Well, you, usually the, the GFOA recommends like 20% of the budget. So that, that's a pretty good size number for you guys to get to. And so I'm gonna say, I wouldn't say a lot of Vermont towns get to that, but that's what the GFOA, GFOA recommends. But you know, if, you, if I was starting with like 10%, or working toward 10%, I think that would be a good goal. But again, it's a risk tolerance of every board. Every board's different, every town is different. It's just one of the things I like to bring up when I'm looking at the numbers from a, from an auditor's perspective. So our general fund is 7.2 million this year in the budget, so that's the target. Um, one thing I just want to add quickly, um, sometimes we've had cash flow challenges since I've been here, and, and Sometimes we can borrow from EFUD, sometimes EFUD borrows from us. Um, but we have, a, we have a million dollar tax stabilization fund on the books, uh, but bear in mind, 400,000 of that is actually loaned to us already. So we have 600,000 invested, 400,000 is essentially cash out the door. Um, and we have cash flow, not huge challenges, but we have minor cash flow challenges. Um, but also bear in mind that the, um, the ARPA funds are generally unspent. So we're really living on the ARPA funds. So um, as we spend the ARPA funds, we've got to find a way to, to build this or we're going to have continuous cash flow challenges. It's not a big deal given our borrowing costs are, are far lower than what you or I could borrow at the, at the private sector rate. Um, but it, it makes for a little bit of instability um, and then it makes me spend a lot of time trying to manage that issue, which isn't a really productive thing to spend your time on. So it would be nice to build this up slowly. So yeah, in, in relation to that, if you look at the fund next to the Highway Capital Fund, uh, you'll see that, that that ends up right now with an unrestricted deficit of about 591901 um, Again, I kind of looked back over the last few years, and this particular fund has uh, gone from positive to negative to positive to negative, and it looks like it's a it's a uh, combination of when projects are happening, timing, was it planned, was it not, was the money you know there, uh, cash flows there or not. So uh, I'm you know this is one again I would like to make sure that everybody's eyes are on to to what is the plan for to get it back to positivity and how do we get there and how do we continue it hopefully to be positive in the future and not draw, draw down into the negative. Um, the rest of the funds there, are, the fund balance is pretty healthy. There was no, no major concerns or there are thoughts uh, from me that I thought I'd go over. Um, if, I, if you're looking at pages 12 through 40, we're not gonna get into this, but basically these are the notes to the financial statements. They give a lot of detail in there. What are the terms of our debt? What are our collateralization of our cash accounts? What are, their, what are our loans receivable? What are our restricted fund balances? If you're looking for a deep dive on any of the balance sheet accounts or any of the fund balances or what makes it up, these notes are great tools to go through and kind of give you a lot more clarity. Again, they can be overwhelming. There's a lot of information there, but if you're looking for something specific about our debt, this is a good place to go to find the terms, to find about uh, how maturities are going to happen over the next <coughs> few years, how debt's going to be paid off. Um, so I just wanted to point that out as well. Obviously, if you're looking at pages uh, 41 through 50, most of you have seen those probably in regular financial reports that you get, budget to actual, on how the year went. Again, a lot of that information now is about six to eight months old, so it's not really all that helpful to go through tonight uh, but hopefully you're getting that stuff on a regular basis um, so that you can kind of monitor the two, 2023 year and future years as well the rest of the funds uh, if you're looking at pages 54 through 61 this any of the funds that weren't in those first two sheets I, I or first sheets I showed you with all the major funds general highway that we went over the rest of the funds are in this section back here so if you're looking for the details of what's going on with the records restoration, the reappraisal, community development, the building reserve, recreation capital reserve, all the information's back here. Again, there were no negative fund balances that I thought we needed to go into. But they all look pretty healthy and no major concerns that I saw there. 
So as part of our, um, uh, part of our work, when we're done our, our testing and our procedures, we always come up with, uh, if there's any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses within the organization, we, we have to point them out. And this will usually generate from auditor adjustments that we had when we were here. And if we're looking at the material weaknesses and the significant deficiencies we point out, there's only, there's only three, three items that we brought up, but they're basically related to how grants receivable will get booked, how deferred revenue gets booked, and so we've been kind of working with the staff over the last couple of years, of hopefully training them to understand, to book those adjustments on their own, not necessarily wait for us to come in and get that all booked and done ahead of time. So that's just one of the, one of the recommendations we would recommend for that. Same thing on accounts payable, cut off. When, when did the accounts payable get booked back to the previous year and did it get done correctly? Again, we've been working with the staff on trying to get that done as well. And so that's, we had a couple of adjustments in that. And then the last item we had was related to netting revenues and expenses. And I think this was in the paving fund. I think some of the paving revenues were netted against expenses. Yeah. So you couldn't tell the gross expense within the audit report or within the financial statement. So we just were suggesting, okay, we grossed it back up with an adjustment and just letting you know to try to make sure that all netting, all that there's no more netting of revenues and expenses. Last items I wanted to go over were basically um, required communications. Um, we had no difficulties in dealing with management. We had no disagreements with management. All the entries that we recommended were posted by, uh, by, um, by management. And so the final books and records as relate to this report, everything's been posted and adjusted. That's pretty much all I had for the presentation. If anybody has any specific questions. Yeah, Richard, um, in your letter uh, to us, uh, and thank you for that, I yeah. really appreciate it. Um, you say that uh, you're not making any assessment uh, as to whether the oversight uh, is sufficient. Uh, the, the, the board's oversight of the municipal uh, function and finance is, yeah. is sufficient. How would we know whether it is? That's a great question. Um, I guess, I guess, to me, you know when it isn't <laughs> because only the, because, because, they because, the because there's usually dysfunction that that, that happens. There, there's communication issues. You're not getting the you know you, are are you seeing when when you're reviewing warrants or you know and I ask this question all the time when I come in and see Tom hey, hey when the when boards are reviewing warrants are they looking at the actual bills are they actually you know are they rubber stamping them those are generally the kind of details you want to know. Are we getting good quarterly reports? Are, are, is the board asking questions about those quarterly reports? Are they engaged financially in, in, the, uh, in the, the reports that they're getting? Looking at fund balances, thinking, talking about cash flows. There's a fine line between you know, being able to overmanage it or manage it correctly. And I'm gonna say that, you know, you're right, I can't quantify or qualify for you, but I know when we, a lot of times when I'm coming in here to do the work, those are the kind of conversations I'm having with the staff. You know, <coughs> you know, I'll read through all the minutes for the whole year, kind of identifying where I think, you know, policies haven't occurred or updates haven't occurred. And so those kind of would be where you would find a lot of that stuff. And since there's not a lot of other management letter recommendations, like I said, I can't quantify it for you, but it feels mm -hmm. like you guys are in the right direction. I guess the one thing I'd add too is in the audit, is your budget to actual? Mm -hmm. um, it's the job of the manager to execute the budget. Right. You know, I've got, I've got leeway to, to make decisions throughout the year where we're going to go over in some areas and under in some areas and try to balance the whole picture. But if the manager is unable to consistently ex execute the budget um, and tells you during the budget work sessions that we're, we're not risking things at this budget, um, it's your job to hold the manager accountable in that instance. Mm -hmm. And it's a fair thing to do. Yeah, I, I, when I looked at, uh, at uh, your financial updates, I always look for discrepancies. Yeah. Places where you underspent by a lot or overspent by a lot um, for an explanation yeah. and, and how you're going to deal with it. Uh, so that's where I look for flags. And then same things when we uh, do the <coughs> style of the warrants here. 
mostly just look at the big ones uh, and make sure that uh, it's budgeted uh, and that uh, the uh, the bills uh, track with the uh, with the summaries. And I don't know. All of us have done this uh, on part. So if anyone wants to speak up or have ask questions, please do. Mike, Mike has his hand raised. Mike. Yeah, Mike. Uh, yeah. Um, just a quick question. I know because we've had some fairly substantial changes in personnel in in the town with a new town manager and a new town clerk. Have you noticed any changes in financial practices from that switchover, or has it been pretty consistent? Well, during the switchover, I know that there was a lot of communication going back and forth about putting new policies into place. And I know during the switchover, what, what I've started to talk to the town about is having control manuals in place, accounting manuals in place, so that anybody new walking in could walk into these manuals and have an idea of how a bill gets paid, how it, uh, how are the, what controls do we have over segregation of duties, and so that you can go to these documents when you're walking in. And I will say, most of my clients don't have them because they're the last thing anybody wants to work on. Everybody's too busy getting the work done, paying bills and getting payroll done. But one of the things I always recommend is those manuals and those uh, control manuals in place to make sure that new people are being trained. But, but to, to your question, there's nothing I saw that, that, that concerned me at all. Mm -hmm. It was just more of a, with that changeover, hey, have we thought about doing this? Thank you. I, I saw a lot of positive changes as well in terms of like, you know, personnel procedures and such that I think will create a much more strong financial uh, stability within the town. So I think, as you said, I think we don't have a lot to worry about right now. And Richard, I don't think we do a lot of cash transactions, uh, but to the extent that we do, uh, do we have, maybe Tom, you can answer this. Do we have sufficient oversight uh, with two people watching the, the money come in? We do at town hall. Um, we don't always at the pool, is the one example that comes to mind where it's pretty small amounts. Um, mm -hmm. We try to do a reconciliation where you, you look at what you actually bought for you know small sales and, and compare that to, to what you took in. Um, and usually that comes in pretty close. Mm -hmm. um, but it's pretty limited cash outside of town hall. And even at town hall, um, not a lot of people paying their tax bill with cash these days, even e <laughs> um, And we have a, uh, compared to St. Albans, um, we have a really high uptake of people who do ACH payments for their, for, for their water and sewer and their taxes, which is, which is great from my perspective. It takes away the, takes away the cash, takes away the checks. Mm -hmm. um, it's all electronic. Another, another observation related to that is one of the things you could do at some point in time is like a, a fraud risk assessment, an internal kind of look at yourselves of where fraud could be occurring, not just from cash transactions, from credit cards, from any potential, you know, where I always look for, I look at, uh, you know, transfer stations, landfills, recreation. Uh, like we said, those are all pretty consistent areas where potential fraud could occur. So that fraud risk assessment would be an internal look, board members, management, taxpayers all talking about controls within the organization to make sure you're identifying where fraud is occurring and then have putting in offsetting controls in place to make sure that the frauds don't occur. Any other questions for uh, Sullivan Powers and Company? Yeah. Hmm? I'm just saying the information received from Michelle, who's the bookkeeper, is that we did a fraud assessment with the consultant that we hired with Bill Shuffleck at the time. Oh, okay. um, yeah. So just to say Perfect. there's been one yeah. within the past two years. But knowing it exists as a board member, I'd look at that. And I, you know, mm -hmm. back to your point, right. where would be a good thing? You know, I would want to review the control managers. I'd want to, you know, not like take the deep dive, but at least sort you of know, cursory. The controls are applied. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And yeah. not to mention your own being a, your own business owner. You're going to have your ideas of where, where some thoughts of controls could be headed in a different direction as well, or, or more controls. So just use that experience, that's all. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.
Next item on the agenda is the um, debrief on flood recovery. And let's see, Tom, uh, are you going to report out in <coughs> place of Tom? I can, yeah. Um, there's still ongoing work. Um, in fact, there's still some, some new people today who contacted the, the Waterbury Help that still have uh, water in their basements and Waterbury Center in places, but there's never huh. an issue. Um, so we're, we're encouraging everyone, um, whether you are now on Randall Street or in Waterbury Center, reach out to FEMA. It's not going to hurt to make a phone call and see if there's any assistance there. And offering, you know, some cleanup help if we have it, the, the cleanup kits, all those things. Um, the state also, at the beginning of August, hired a long-term recovery director. Um, so, um, through the help of Tom Stevens, he's reached out to me. We're going to schedule a meeting um, to try to talk about and raise some of the issues we've talked about at the board, and uh, see to what extent they can help, to what extent they can be involved, um, mm -hmm. and assist with us. Um, you know, one of my comments to him is, is it's clearly been a town-by-town -town effort. Um, so I think whether it's the state or VLCT, but having some umbrella organization help us deal with some of these issues, which are truly regional, is going to be necessary. Mm -hmm. So feel free to send me, I'm, I'd love to have you send me your ideas about what I should raise at that meeting if you've got specifics, and if you want to join, let me know, and we'll figure that out. Okay. Any suggestions off the bat from other board members? Okay. Uh, at the last meeting, we voted to have a um, flood preparedness committee. Mm -hmm. Natural disaster. Committee. Natural disaster committee. preparedness okay. committee. Yes. Would you like me to? Yes, can you just uh, give us a your update on that? Um, yes. Um, during the week, Roger reached out to me for more information. Um, unfortunately, I've been incredibly busy with the work uh, that I do to keep a roof over my head, but I came to some conclusions. Um, as far as the board is concerned, or as far as the committee is concerned, is a five-member committee. You don't want it too small. You don't want it too big. Five seems right. It can break a tie. That includes the select board liaison. Um, and then, essentially, I was going to use the goals that were outlined in the proposal um, as a jumping point. They are not concrete, but I, any committee would be able to work off them at least. <coughs> Okay. So, um, if we were to open up, uh, uh, solicit uh, volunteers to serve on that committee, um, the, do you have any uh, ideas to what the tenure might be? To um, I would say usually. Our standard tenure, or what is our standard tenure for a committee? Two years? It varies from one to three. Mm -hmm. One to three. The question mm -hmm. for the board is, is it a permanent committee, or is it a committee to do, do some of this work, and then essentially, right. once we've got a plan in place, then it would be the job of staff to maintain it. Right. Um, the idea behind the initial proposal was that it would be a permanent <coughs> committee that always keeps us ready for the eventuality of a natural disaster. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would say, work it like the select board, right? We have three members who are three years and two that are one. Do it the same way. Mm -hmm. Be at least my recommendation. Yeah. Yeah, Danny. An idea would be to um, meet off in the beginning while there's lots, you know, to do, um, and then perhaps it goes from a monthly meeting committee to a quarterly meeting committee just to stay fresh, up to date, et cetera. But if there's not as much pressing items, not let it fall to the wayside, but you know, not meet just for the sake of meeting. So that's an idea as well. Right. Ask a question. Sure. Are we, are 
are we at the agenda item that is debrief on flood recovery, or are we at the after action review? We're still on uh, the uh, flood recovery, but this was a motion that was passed at the last and meeting. I understand, I watched it. So the, the understanding that, I think to some degree, I understand what you're saying, right? You want to have another committee that's going to, you guys just had a, and I don't think it's perhaps um, spot on, but you, you have an emergency plan that was just written in April. Has this, um, suggestion that's being brought up looked at that plan and, and decided what did not go appropriately or because mm -hmm. before you start down the path of another committee i would say don't duplicate right can i do my yeah so the next well, the, act, the next item which you brought up the after action will address that specifically yeah. what that emergency management plan did cover and what it didn't where the absence of like where the gaps are what the imminent needs are and this committee will both help synthesize all of this after action reporting into a specific natural disaster plan versus just any kind of emergency, which is the more broad LEM, the one you're referring to, um, and also talk about more like literal kind of people on the ground action. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So yeah. A, a plan is great until the action happens and then you have to react, right? right. So, so I get it, I'm not, I'm not advocating you not do this. I'm saying that you should probably, and I think you just hammered where I was getting at. The first action of this committee is to assess the after action, what just occurred, and see what the delta is. What didn't right. work well? Yeah, that's the plan. That is the plan. Okay. So I, before saying it's permanent right now, I would say take that step, and then you can fold it into, well, we think this is probably something we want to maintain. It's basically, I would recommend you come back on that discussion because people have time, right? And they want to put time into it right now because right. it's really close to what just occurred. Right. But the further you get away from a, a, a problem like this, mm -hmm. you'll start seeing people kind of peel off. It's just natural. Right. So, right. Okay. Which is, I think, the point I'm was sorry, why just... we're trying to get this to move forward yeah. right. sooner rather than there's later. Also, there's also, um, as far as the recommendations I had made in the proposal, there are contingency plans for when people decide that they don't want to be part of the, the committee anymore. It's all built in. Right. Uh, well, uh, I don't know if you want to go any farther with that. Maybe it, we're maybe it's right that, that we don't have uh, a plan in place for having a description as to what the responsibilities of the committee, committee members are yet or right. the I can, office? I can put that together by next meeting. Okay. And remember, like, similar to the housing task force, these are created because there's a broad uh, maybe mission statement, right? There doesn't need to be a 10-year action step-by-step -step plan for a new committee or task force. Mm -hmm. If it's a two-year term, it's a two-year term, and if in two years, we're still looking to fill the we're looking to fill the seats still great and if not you know but but the you know the general broad like mission statement of the committee can can be what forms it and then you know we've got those first two tasks right which will not be done in one meeting so um, more tasks will arise as those are accomplished so um, I just yeah it's okay to get started with that broad umbrella when we're ready versus knowing what they're going to be doing for the next two years or beyond, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris? I believe there's been some discussion within the Agency of Transportation how to address some of these communities that have zero funding to uh, repair the damage. And uh, <coughs> I think they were talking about low interest loans, and I don't know if any anything has to come to fruition on that, and whether or not it's, you know, again, Waterbury kind of dodged the bullet uh, when it comes to our, a lot of our major roads, but just to, I don't know what the criteria is and what categories it might cover. So. Yeah, Tom? <coughs> um, I don't know about every town. I know the, I'm sure there's some programs I've missed because some of this is still being rolled out, but uh, the Vermont Municipal Bond Bank has offered us low interest loans um, in essence to cover the FEMA cost or to, or to 
and potentially to cover the difference in, in what we get reimbursed versus our true costs. I haven't taken advantage of that net. I haven't needed to, but I, I may well at some date. And just to make this for other municipalities in Vermont, in some cases, damages exceeded annual budgets and FEMA operates on reimbursement. So just to say some towns are facing an immediate <coughs> need for that type of lending, Waterbury is fortunate to not be in that position right now, but hence those programs are being developed. And I also believe that Mr. Scott, Phil Scott, signed a bill that basically allowed a lot of these aggregate quarries to harvest material from areas that they weren't allowed to before, basically kind of opened the door for uh, getting necessary materials to help assist with this problem. Another aspect, uh, Tom. One thing I just want to add is when you, we talked last meeting about creating the committee, but then staffing the committee uh -huh. and, and paying that staff. So when you make your motion to create the committee, just give me some clear direction. I can I can hire someone if you want to hire someone. I can figure mm -hmm. it out. Just make sure that's a part of the future consideration. Um, another aspect of uh, flood recovery is uh, flood mitigation. Uh, I spoke at last meeting about uh, our interest in uh, looking farther into this. I have had some uh, further conversations. There's a study being led by uh, UVM uh, working with uh, the flood management in the uh, Winooski uh, watershed. And I've been invited to their meeting in September uh, to see what action steps uh, could be taken. Uh, there are a couple of different uh, things under consideration. One is the uh, uh, removing some uh, some materials from the uh, Harvey farm across the river. Uh, another is uh, removing material from the cornfield, which is owned by the state, which would increase uh, the capacity for uh, water to collect without inundating uh, the downtown area, uh, at least uh, to a larger extent. So those are things that uh, we'll be taking a closer look at going forward. Um, unless there's other things to discuss about uh, the flood recovery, let's move on to the after action review. Danny, do you want to take that? Sure. So, um, as we just touched on a little bit, what, um, what we're working on is compiling a document and synthesizing the information of what we did just in general, factually, what went really well, what worked really well, and then what was the challenge or what needs to be done differently in the future. So um, Roger made some categories such as preparedness, early warning, and during the flood, next day, next week, and future. Um, and so those are sort of the categories that we're dumping that information in. Um, and folks, I, I've begun it, and then the folks to contribute will be the board as a whole, town staff, um, including, I think, public works feedback, um, people like uh, Bob Butler, who was helping in certain areas, uh, the chief, and then um, Liz Schlegel, Tom Drake, et cetera. So I think getting feedback from as many of those coordinators and people on the ground as possible, I'm sure I'll leave people out. Um, and then working to synthesize the information, comparing um, some of that preparedness piece to our area management plan, um, and then you know talking about how can this Group, how can this committee help in that work so that we're a you know that we have something to turn to when natural disasters happen again um, and then something to rely on like we talked about so that it's not just in people's memories like we relied on this time around from um, Irene so um, right now it's just like high level categories and then kind of brained up of information to be better synthesized in the future I don't know if there's more detail you want, or just that kind of process. Like, I don't know, you know. Um, uh, what do you think is your timeline on that? So my notes are, I would say, 85% finished. I circulated it to a small group to start getting input. I didn't give anybody deadlines or anything. I wanted to kind of, since I missed last meeting, make sure I was on the right track. Um, and then uh, once, uh, once I, like, after this meeting, I can you know, circulate it to that wider group and then kind of set deadlines. Do you have an idea of like, 
do we want this by mid-September? Do we want this sooner than that? Um, I mean, I guess just like all the input when I say this. Um, maybe you just keep it on the agenda and you can give us an update Continue next time. Updates. And then, uh, you know, ideally, I think by the end of September, it'd be nice to have okay. something that can be presented to the public okay, and, and we may have more, more input from the public because okay. we certainly don't have all the answers. Thank you. Will do. Okay, any other questions, comments about after action review, flood recovery? Okay, let's move on to the presentation of the charter. I'll be relatively quick on this, I think. Um, so we have started um, fairly informal charter conversations back in April, um, really they began right after town meeting day. Um, it's really focused on two provisions, two parts. The first is the authority of the manager and the second is the local option tax. Um, a little bit of background. Um, on the authority of the manager, which I can get to each part of it separately. Um, the language that I drafted can be written um, any number of ways. There's dozens of towns with charters. Um, many of them have, have language about the authority of the manager. Um, so you can slice this and dice this a lot of ways. I reviewed this with Jim Barlow, who's a Vermont attorney who's got a specialty in this sort of work. Um, and I just want to go over some of the some of the individual items in the article um, to give a little background. Um, broke it up into a couple of slides, but in essence, there's four sentences. Um, first one: the manager shall hire, uh, appoint, discipline, and remove all town employees, subject to our personnel rules. Um, that one is clear enough, and that's been our practice, uh, with a couple of exceptions, because there's a few positions that are outlined in state law um, that I can't hire. An example right now is we have a vacant zoning administrator. Um, and it's a little bit awkward because that position has to be recommended to the select board by the planning commission. Um, what makes that especially odd is that the zoning administrator really works for the development review board. So to truly have a fair interview process, um, and then once that person's hired, reports to me on a daily basis. Um, and then subsequently every few years has to get reappointed by the Planning Commission. So to really have a fair hiring process, I've got to involve the Planning Commission, who, who makes the formal recommendation. I've got to involve the Development Review Board, who would see this person every two weeks. And then obviously I have to be there. And then Neil Leitner, who's our Planning Director, who works close with the person, has to be there. So it, it's a complex process um, to begin with. And then you have the potential for I think some conflict to arise um, in the event the parties don't agree on, on the job the person is doing. So I think having a clear line of authority simply makes the process easier. Um, also eliminates the need for the reappointments. Um, so I think that's just a cleaner way to, to, to manage uh, the hiring process for those few positions. Um, the second, uh, the second uh, sentence, um, the manager shall fix the compensation of benefits of employees, um, in essence, in accordance with our budget. And there's a lot of different ways to write this. Um, 
the short version of how I view this is that the manager um, and the select board have to have a working relationship um, and the manager has to execute the budget. The manager has the authority to, uh, within the day-to-day -day duties to give increases. Um, the manager has the authority to hire, but the manager does not have carte blanche authority to make substantial decisions that impact the long-term future of the town. Um, so this, uh, this in essence, puts some guardrails on it. Um, it ensures that my authority is not unabridged and I'm ultimately accountable to the select board. And I think that's a pretty critical sentence to have in there. Uh, the next two, um, the next one I think is fairly straightforward. Um, I can designate authority to department heads and that's the way traditionally things have been done here. Great example is we've got a public works director who's been here a long, long time. Um, under this language, I can say to him that you've got the ability to hire someone. You can check in with me, but, but you've got the ability to hire um, at my discretion. Um, the other piece is that this is consistent with our employee handbook because in the event of something um, disciplinary, it begins with the department head and it essentially can end with me. So that's consistent uh, with their authority and I think that makes perfect sense and it really codifies our history and our, and our current uh, practice. Um, and then the final one, which, which I think is, is maybe the most critical of the four, is that uh, the manager has to check in with the select board when hiring a department head. Um, the sentence does not say the form of approval. The sentence, uh, in essence, says, um, shall be approved. So I just hired a rec director who was introduced to you. When I hired the recreation director, I involved the recreation committee in the hiring, and I involved two members of the select board, which I think is, is normal and reasonable. Um, in the future, I would check in with the select board, and, and if they wanted to be a direct part of the hiring process, they could be. If they said, you know what, go ahead. We trust your judgment. That's fine. Um, but ultimately, they've got some role here, um, which, I think is, which I think is important. Um, especially when we think of, of a public works director um, who's got uh, a big chunk of employees overseeing a lot of responsibilities. Um, so that's the part about the manager's authority. Um, the final thing I wanted to say here is um, this, in essence, was not my request, that the manager's authority, and especially the hiring, was something really brought to me by the select board when I started, because we'd recently gone through the planning and zoning positions, and we're going through it now, and it's it's an extra layer and it's a difficult process. Um, on to the local option tax, which I'm sure everyone is interested in. Um, it's a very simple article. I'm just wondering if you're going to have questions on the whole thing or um, what's going to be your process for questions? <coughs> Anytime, I think. Go ahead. Do you want to start with the manager's authority questions? Well, that's what I just was wondering. Um, I have a couple of questions. Sure, absolutely. Where is it? Can you go back? Can you go back to the language? Um, Anyone in particular? Uh, yeah, that one's fine because that's got all four up there. Um, so I was un I was unclear, Tom, when you were talking about the um, the zoning administrator. Uh, so this would preclude that process that happens now. So you would say that this would be okay. So I just you you referenced um, state law. So I was wondering if there was state law that requires it to be done a different way. State law requires that the planning commission make a recommendation to the select board about the hire. It doesn't require that the select board take their recommendation. Okay. Um, so it's a bit it's a bit awkward to begin with, I think. Um, but as I mentioned, the, the position really works for the development review board. Right. So it's a it's an extra layer of awkwardness and, and difficulty, I think. So uh, recognize yourself. Um, <laughs> would this supersede uh, that state statute? Yes. Uh -huh. Melissa. 
I was going to say the same thing. Just to clarify, I think it's we're defaulting, obviously, to state statute, which candidly serves much smaller municipalities well, and in water rates case, I think has become kind of outdated as someone who served on the planning commission and sacrificed, you know, three out of 24 meetings in a year to do interviews. It was really challenging, um, just from use yeah, of time I perspective. Have a with this. I just was wanting to know the interrelation. Right, and so mm -hmm. I'm, default, I'm assuming the attorney's review said we're allowed to supersede uh, by having it. Uh, so charter. that other language is probably for uh, if, if a town doesn't have a charter, Correct. then this is the procedure you use. It's okay. default. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. You ready? Hey, that wasn't my only question. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so it, the, the compensation piece in accordance with compensation ranges and schedule of benefits. So. Uh, you know, I'm aware the select board sets the benefit packages. The compensation ranges, are there comp formal compensation ranges for specific positions? You know, like so, public works director, or zoning administrator, or, uh, is there formal ranges? There are not, and that's where I had the conversation with Jim Barlow at some length. Um, there are no formal ranges, but, the, but compensation is very clear in the budget. And so in essence, in essence, the range is the range is the budget, um, and the range and the. That's not how I read this. I'll be honest. I mean, it, it, uh, I, I understand what you're saying, um, but I mean that. I mean, theoretically, you know, a, a town manager could, you know, uh, I get, there's there's no guidance, I guess, other than what was previously paid to a previous employee or what's currently being paid so, to an employee. It's a great question. I've had a lot of conversations about this. Um, in general, some positions and some departments, the compensation is clear because it's a one-person department, and, and, and for a bunch of the general fund, where a bunch of town hall staff were sort of lumped into an item. And so we've never had formal ranges from that, from the perspective you're saying that we don't have a job description that says the planning director makes between 70 and 80,000. Um, but we have a really clear budget. And so in talking to Jim Barlow and, and fleshing this out, um, if the select board sees in my quarterly updates or if they, sees in, if they see in my budget proposal that, hey, that the compensation of that department of two people went from 140 to 160, there's an obvious level of approval needed. If, if the across the board raises are, are 3% for employees and that department went from 100 to 103,000, it's a lot more clear. So I think I mentioned at the beginning, there's a lot of different ways to, to slice and dice this. Um, and in the end, it boils down to, to the manager and the select board having a relationship where these things are openly discussed and agreed upon. And, and you're right, it's a, it's a bit of a challenge sometimes to, any one individual can have a difference of opinion about how that, how that should be phrased. Yeah, I just, I just uh, you know, uh, if the, everybody agrees to submit this, Tom and I are the ones going to have to be describing what this means uh, in, in, at the legislature. And so I, I think that, uh, I'm just going to say, I think that the, um, that, people, logical people who disagree about about that. And so that's just, I'm just flagging that um, as a potential question. Sure. Uh, okay. uh, so yeah, to, to, to tag on to the back of that, to me that was very vague. I think, uh, you know, if you had a, a budget that was established annually and that was your budget and then within we had to stay within those parameters would probably make people feel a little bit better I know it's hard to lock down like you said compensation specifically I mean but the federal government does it right they're only allowed to spend so much on bonuses or or raises or things like that I think not having any range established um, and, and I think as a town, we've seen some compensation packages happen quite quickly and, and very frequently in the last few years that kind of, you know, increased, uh, you know, some of that deficit that we had. So that was just, that was one, one question. And then town employees, does that include anybody who's a contractor or is it just town employees? Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, and I apologize. Uh, I, I know Teresa because she's our representative. Cheryl. Cheryl? Yes, yeah, Cheryl. And the, the challenge with something like compensation raises for someone for a government our size is um, it's pretty difficult when you have small departments. Um, and sometimes your compensation can vary substantially in the event of turnover. Sometimes the market moves quickly on you, which has happened to us in the past couple of years. Um, sometimes you advertise a job and you get a candidate that, quite frankly, is above and beyond your expectations, and you you realize that it, you you know you come to the conclusion it's worth it to compensate that person and to get that person on the team. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, as I mentioned, there's a lot of ways to, to slice and dice this. Um, I think it's reasonably consistent with our practices. I think it's consistent with how we develop our budget and how we discuss our budget. Um, but, and you can read 10 different town charters and, and they all have similar language um, suited to them. Tom, you had your hand up earlier? Yeah, I just wanted to be clear for, and, and ask the select board, um, just to be clear, we don't have a charter now, so we operate by state, whatever the state tells us to, because or what we're allowed to, because we're Dylan's law state. And we have to ask, so now, we had a charter, the village did, um, and part of the 20-year-old conversation or 40-year-old conversations about merger was to assume that charter it would have been easier to assume that charter from the state's perspective because as Teresa mentioned, we have to, the town has to pass this and then the state has to give us permission to put this into effect. And I just, is that the way we're working here? Is that, and, but the bonus of having the charter is that we can operate slightly differently from the state statute. So when we wanna change our charter, we can do that on a local basis a lot more easily than we can now. So I just wanna, so a lot of this conversation is about the levels and whatnot, that'll come out you know, as we do business. But, um, and, it, and it gets to point, the second point, the second article, which is then we can have, like we can't easily have this conversation about the tax, the sales tax, unless we have a charter, is that, is that, am I, am I remembering this correctly? That's correct, you, you cannot. Um, I'm so sorry I am, but. You can have a charter that simply is a one sentence charter that refers to the local option tax, for example. But, yeah, and um, just for clarification, we have been talking about both the local, local option tax and this change uh, in the municipal authority to just simplify uh, the the hiring practices for a couple of individuals that now def uh, defers to the default uh, in the state uh, statute. Uh, so we wanted to put both of these together, bring it up for public discussion, uh, have another open meeting after this one, probably in October, and then bring this to uh, Australian ballot uh, for the town to vote on. <coughs> Probably the beginning of November if things go well. Uh, maybe having to wait until December if things go less than ideal. Um, yeah. Well, I was just wondering because we don't have a charter. I think it needs to be a town meeting, not Australian ballot, because we have to default to our general. Oh, okay. I believe it's Australian ballot. Okay, yeah. great. Right. Out of town meeting. Yes. We have a special meeting. <laughs> right. Um, and and then, uh, as Tom was saying, then the, uh, the recommendation will go uh, to you. Hopefully you and Teresa can introduce this uh, to the legislature. And yeah, Tom. One other piece I want to say is with Article 1, there is no pride of authorship here. So if the select board thought, well, you know, the, the compensation and benefits and the way it's been done historically is, is fine, that whole sentence can be struck. I, I would argue that the first sentence about uh, making the manager the, the appointing authority is, is really useful and valuable. Um, mm -hmm. Having the manager 
in essence cede some authority to other department heads is really valuable and consistent with our practice, so I think it should be codified. And then the final sentence about having the select board weigh in on appointment, I also think is really important. Um, but if, if people are hung up on the, sent on the second sentence and, and want to change it or remove it, no pride of authorship. It was something I worked out, Jim Barlow, that I thought made sense. I understand from other people's perspective it can be a bit confusing, so. Uh, Alyssa? I wanted to ask some follow-ups on number two. Um, I, one, wanted to give Tom props for being the one who, when we had the audit presentation, said, I'm the manager and have to stay to the budget and hold me accountable if I don't. So in terms of budgets, I think he tries to be on that. Um, for both of you who raised about the um, this item two, is it the structure of the sentence or the fact that we haven't adopted this in practice? Just to say, during my time on the select board, like when Bill Shepleck presented his annual raises, we actually received a memo that would be almost identical to what this policy and adoption would be that said, planning director, one position, gave a salary range. Public works, seven positions, gave salary ranges. So if we were to, in a more formal process, which I recognize the board haven't adopted that, is it having this provision or you think that this provision is not reflecting the current practice? Um, what you just described is not reflected in that sentence. I mean, the way I read that sentence, it says that the municipal manager, um, so that the, the select board sets some, you know, this is what everybody receives for benefits and here are the salary ranges for X number of positions and now uh, the town uh, municipal manager can um, you know, higher into positions at those, at, you know, at what's been established. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that doesn't seem the same as what you just, what you just said, Alyssa. So I guess, well, I'm saying in practice, yes, it wasn't in approval saying, here's the admission, go forth and do it. I was saying in a hypothetical scenario, if we have a set of current existing practices, the select board wanted to codify more formally in that way, to me, that is what the second sentence is getting. So I guess we have a different reading of it, which is what I was trying to suss out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think also, you know, what Tom was just saying, that second sentence actually is sort of a subset of the first sentence, I mean, as well. I mean, uh, it could theoretically be covered in the first sentence, um, subject to provisions of personnel, you know, rules and policies or whatever. Um, so I, I, just, I just was asking for clarification because um, I hadn't, I hadn't known about compensation ranges um, for you know specific positions, and you know as Tom said, sometimes it's a one position, and you know the budget is what you have. You know I get that, so it doesn't make sense. But if it you know for larger departments like the uh, you know the road um, highway department, you know where there's more employees and there's different people, multiple people in the same kind of position, um, you know uh, just. An equity kind of um, consideration is all. So, uh. so a really simple question, but so are you basically like the human resources for town employees? Again, like you hire, board. you fire, you determine. I've just never seen any place that doesn't have a, a range of scale for salaries or that a group of people just determine I can't work here anymore because of. I'm just curious, I mean. So, we have a range and a scale for all of our summer hires. Um, for every other town employee, their, their salaries were, their wages were what they were before I started. Um, they're generally consistent. There's some, some minor differences for tenure, but we don't have an automatic system where you know X number of years you get a, a bonus per se or, or an increased rate um, to me, when I was developing this and talking with Jim Barlow, we went over our budget practice, and in our budget for the highway department, which is the biggest, there's a, there's a line for salaries. Um, an example I can give is, before I was manager, but when I was here, Bill Shepleck came into the town to a sweat board meeting and said, our wages are no longer competitive, we've lost someone, we're looking at neighboring towns, and we're a couple bucks behind per hour. I feel like I've got to do this to, to retain our staff, and we're gonna go over budget. And they gave the okay, and, and those numbers were reflected next year. So to me, I think of the word range, I think of it in terms of the department overall, and the town overall, I don't think of it in terms of any one person. 
like you might if you were in a, a federal job where you know your pay is level 30 and level 30 is what it is. Um, no, I was, about, I was talking about range being you have so much in your annual budget, so not maybe not everybody gets the same compensation that year, right? So maybe you hire somebody new and the compensation is what it has to be, and so therefore other people that maybe you plan for annually in that budget, they just don't get that compensation or that bonus or something. So leaving it vague could put you us in a deficit because of, you know, if we don't have things that are standardized or, or there's like merit raises, there's cost of living wages, and sometimes there's a freeze. So it sounds like you just get to do what you feel is important to keep an employee employed. So but I think the approved by the select board is probably a, I mean, that's the checks and balances yeah. pieces of it. So, um, I mean, I, the, the process that you've described is that you would make a recommendation to the select board and that's, that's the approval process. And, you would say whether or not this was in budget, whether it was over budget, whether we, we need to do to like you, the example they just gave. Um, so the the part that I was having um, confusion about is whether or not there was something you know established already, and then you're making a decision, and you and it, it's the the compensation range and benefits that have been approved by the select board, not the um, higher. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, the way I, it could be just the sentence structure, frankly. Yeah, it seems like it's, it's how it's written. So I think in a couple of notes, it doesn't drastically change. Having that in or out doesn't drastically change the way we're already doing things. Right. So if we can't really consent, like come to a consensus of how to word it really clearly, I think it could go for now and then be a longer sure. term addition. I'm not saying we can't come to that consensus, but it doesn't drastically make an improve like like line one makes a drastic improvement in our processes. That doesn't change a whole lot. It's what we're already doing. It's just not worded super clearly so folks aren't really understanding or we have maybe some improvements to make on our process. Um, but I think also we haven't really gone through this with Tom yet. Like as Alyssa was saying, Bill would come to us you know, during budget season and approach us with those ranges and salaries, et cetera. So we haven't gone through this with Tom yet. So I think we still have yet to see what that process is and then we can reflect and say, how do we make this better? Or just because this is how we've been doing it, maybe that isn't the way we should continue to do it. So. I, I think it's a, it's a okay thing to, I, I think fix is the word that I'm sort of like struggling with. Mm -hmm. um, so the process that you all have been describing is that the municipal manager recommends um, and the select board approves. And um, uh, so just yeah. as an F, that's just a recommendation that maybe you change that to. You the, could easily say the municipal manager sets the compensation and benefits of town employees in accordance with the compensation range and scheduled benefits approved by the select board. And then what you're doing is in fact, see, I'm kind of a select board junkie. I watch this as much as I watch the other. <laughs> so, so I saw that discussion that Alyssa talked about and how um, Mr. Sheplock brought it to the attention of the select board. I thought it was very fair. It set a range. I, I would say that if you get too um, specific, as with most things in regulation, what you do is pigeonhole you into a process yeah. that now you're not actually uh, free to do what you would like to do. And it's like we're being that, um, the, the people's representatives kind of set that, as does the marketplace, right? So, I mean, Bill's comments before were because you were losing, or potentially losing some people. Um, the marketplace is gonna drive some of that. But, and you're gonna do that, I'm assuming, on an annual basis. The idea, though, I, the one area that's a little fuzzy with me is the benefit side. Compensation's one thing. Benefits is what we're getting kind of hammered on. And that's something that probably needs some deliberate thoughts. But as an example, <laughs> when insurance goes up, <laughs> though that affects everyone to include taxpayers, not just employees. One so. piece about the benefits, uh, the history here, which I intend to adhere to is, um, so there's town employees, um, but some people who work in this building are technically legal EFUD employees. Yeah. So there's a joint. Have a discussion later. Yeah, there's, a, <laughs> there's a joint meeting. There's a joint meeting every year. There has been for a long number of years. Once the insurance rates are out, uh, we're we're both boards. 
review those rates and, and determine the, the town and the FUD share versus the employee share. So really the benefit is fixed at that point. Okay. Yes, sir. Could you state your name, please? Yes, uh, Ken Melville, uh, 683 Maple Street. Mm -hmm. um, my comment is a brief one. I just wanted to comment about the, uh, the zoning administrator being hired as an ordinary town employee as opposed to being appointed to a term as the default standard in state law. Um, and what I would say is, if that's the only thing that you accomplished with this charter, you would have accomplished quite a bit. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an anachronistic, archaic, uh, antiquated uh, custom that the state has in state law, and um, I don't think it makes any sense for Waterbury. Also, for the record, I used to be on the Planning Commission. I was the chair, and um, back when Steve was here, we have made some recommendations for changing some of the hierarchical structure within the planning department, which I think made a lot of sense. And this would make a lot more sense to further that goal. So I, I applaud that, and uh, I would certainly say that I would support that 100%. Thank you. Okay. Any further comments on this section? Yeah. Sure. Uh, the third line, this municipal manager may authorize a department head to hire, appoint, discipline, or remove employee subject to manager's discretion and supervision. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? And um, <coughs> you know me, as, as a prior select board member and a businessman of 40 years, I'm about performance base, getting the employee through the door, hiring uh, them on is one thing, but then, you know, year over year, their performance uh, and compensation has always been a huge sticking point with me. Um, how does this help you or help the town taxpayers when it comes to it, I'm tired of the, um, the municipalities and, quite honestly, businesses being held hostage by um, people that are be, being hired and, you, and you're paying them in excess just to have a body to fill a position. Uh, we're seeing it everywhere. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'd like to think that uh, we can make changes to, to help root so. that out. <clears throat> Two things I'd say. The first is uh, Vermont is what's called a louder mill state, and, and what that what that means in short is that um, if you're disciplined, you have an appeal right. So in our employee handbook, if if an employee is disciplined by their department head, they can appeal to me. If I if I discipline a department head, uh, they can appeal to the select board. Um, so that's that's consistent. But the other piece here is that it says, first of all, the, the, the word is may, not shall. So there's not a requirement. If I've got a department head who's brand new, I might take over that function for some time until they're comfortable. Um, but it also allows that department head um, to take action in the event I'm not available. If I'm on vacation, if I'm indisposed and something happens as super critical, that department head doesn't need me to suspend an employee, um, to somehow discipline an employee, um, or to hire an employee. Um, if there's someone who I trust their judgment, they can go ahead and, and, and make those first level decisions on their own. I've always got the right as the manager to step in. Um, and I think that's how the organization should be managed. May I? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, and Shout out to the employee handbook, which hadn't been updated for a very, very long time, but now is really helpful in exactly what you're talking about with reviews and clear, much more modern procedures and things like that. So i um, really excited to have that as well this year being, being passed and implemented. And to give an example, I was on vacation a few weeks back, um, and I, I had one bar, so I was available, but there was a disciplinary issue that came up with a brand new department head. <laughs> Um, so I fortunately was able to take the call and, and, and go from there. Um, but those situations happen. Um, 
appreciate the explanation. Um, and the, the select board, whether it's now or or later, um, we can we can work on the sentence sentence or right. Like I said no pride of authorship, so we can remove the second sentence. Yeah, I think maybe it does need a little further clarification, particularly the second second sentence. Um, but any other questions on this component? Let's move forward. Second sentence, um, Article 2, would pertain to the, uh, it's commonly called the local option tax, the 1% sales tax. And as written, it is one sentence. So uh, this could be written um, several different ways uh, to do it by category. Um, what I'll point out uh, at the bottom of the slide is essentially all the major retail centers in Vermont already have this tax. Um, so I actually think not having it puts us at a competitive disadvantage uh, from that perspective, from the perspective of the town budget, from the perspective of diversifying our revenue, which any business tries to do. Uh, not on this list, there's also a few that, that uh, just have you know an alcohol tax or just have a woman meals tax, but, but these are the towns with, with the full Monty that, that I think is appropriate for Waterbury. Um, to flesh it out a little bit, um, so these are your current tax rates for sales from meals alcohol, um, and all those would increase by 1%. Uh, doesn't impact buying a vehicle, that's a separate part of state law. Um, doesn't apply to prescription drugs, doesn't apply to medicine, um, doesn't apply to groceries. I'm not 100% clear yet on clothing. I believe there's some, some expensive, uh, essentially luxury clothing that it would apply to. Um, but I, I don't have 100% of those details, but my understanding is most clothing is exempt. Um, it does hit short-term rentals, um, and that's collected and paid uh, by those rental companies. Um, and it does apply to internet purchases. Um, so the Amazons of the world are, are collecting it and paying it. So Hopefully this is, go ahead, Tom. Sorry, it just has to do with the charter and now the local option tax. Right. Is the charter going to finally collapse into one town of Waterbury, full stop? Not as proposed today. Then I don't understand. I don't understand. Where, where would be a better option than now? I mean, and, and Tom, I, I get it, but. What, what I'm suffering here, remember, I'm the select board junkie, right? This conversation continues and continues and gets pushed and pushed, and I just don't understand the mechanics of running a municipality and now a town. The benefit's just to do a local option tax, but guess what? That local option tax covers everyone, right? But the primary businesses are in the EFUD district. Yeah. So I, I, I just don't understand why don't why why aren't we just willing to go all in? I think that question um, legally to execute has to first be directed at the EFUD board. Yeah. Before, the Before you want people to vote at the EFUD board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see where I'm going with it? And, and you know I was going to ask this question. But <laughs> I don't want to be the jerk. I just, I at some point, I, I'm going to go to the EFUD meeting in a week. Next week, I think, second week in every I'm month. No. And I'm going to ask the same question. And, it, you know, it, again, I just don't understand. If we want to be a community, if we want to really establish a town, let's have a town. If I may, um, we have a town. Waterbury, we are the select board for that town, and you're addressing us. Okay. So, um, are you on the e board? board? Am I on the e board? Yeah. I am not. Do you go to the e board meeting? I've been to a couple, yes. Okay. I don't go every time. So I'll address you then. Okay. So why can this not be part of the plan? A, we want it to pass. Why would you, we think it wouldn't pass? Uh, how long have you lived in this town? Born and raised, but I have a brief stint of 28 years in the military. Okay. Uh, this town has been divided. Uh, between the village and the town for a number of years. Are we going to continue to allow it? 
Um, I'm just thinking strategically. Uh, I, I, I accept your point, and, and frankly, I've been part of this, uh, try, trying to find the solution to, to this issue, but I'm not sure we're going to find it uh, this year. And uh, I'm not willing to sacrifice this measure for something that's been going on for the 20 year, 23 years that I've been living here. Um, I, I think your point is a good one, and I'd be glad to raise it, but I don't think it's appropriate for right now. Yeah, Teresa. Um, I just want to say that I 100% agree with you. Um, I, I think that, um, that we, as a community, are missing out by not having this ability um, to have the local option tax, and I know it's been discussed over the course of you know, time. Um, and, I, and I don't disagree um, with this gentleman either. However, I think that is a, it is a much broader conversation. It needs a lot of thought, a lot of facilitated discussion. And um, I just, I, I wouldn't want to jeopardize our ability to have this pass, um, which I think we can get quite a lot of support for um, with the controversial discussion. Um, that would ensue about that. So I, I agree with you, uh, Roger. Well, can we at least have a discussion on that? Sure. I mean, no, uh, I'm not talking about not here. I mean, as, as, no, I'm not talking about here. Yeah, I understand your point, and I'm addressing you now. So I'm yeah. going to ask that a question. You put a lot of things in a parking lot. Mm -hmm. This is a 1% tax because it's a revenue discussion. It comes out of the parking lot. Why can't we take this EFUD consolidation conversation to the next level? We can. And on a timeline. Uh, Alyssa. Well, I would just say, you, I'm now responding to a question not directed at me, which is bad form. But nonetheless, I would say, I am fairly aware that Bill Shekapolak hoped very dearly before he retired to have resolved this issue. Yes. And so in my time in the board in the two years, we tried to start this conversation unsuccessfully for a variety of reasons. It's a two board problem. Again, you're sitting and addressing one board. I do spend quite a lot of my time at EFUD. They do quite a lot of other infrastructure needs. So again, I don't dispute it's a goal the community should have for one day. But as someone who has also, since 2017, said, wow, I'm the economic development director, and it's so darn confusing when I have a new business coming to town and I have to send them to this board for their loan fund and different things. We've taken action over time to diminish that. This year, we now own the property down at the Ice Center. We now own Rusty Parker Park as the municipality, the town of Waterbury. The 41 voters you referenced in EFUD said, this is a good movement towards becoming one unified municipal political entity and have made changes. So there actually has been, in the past several years, steps to move towards that, to say that the only functions they're doing are water and sewer, that former general government functions, including the money that went with them, should be transferred to the town. And those actions have taken place. So I would counter that it is something we care about, it's something we want to move. I recognize it hasn't come out of the parking lot yet due to timing with the legislature. And what we're talking about around wanting to have local option tax sooner, this has been prioritized. I, don't misunderstand. I don't want to derail your one percent, right? That's that's taxes. Again, inflation will create its own churn here, as does the leg legislature's other taxes we have not absorbed yet. We will absorb those next year. The, 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 the whole question to me though, again, comes down to just having a roadmap. And I get it, 20-year discussion, 30-year discussion. It, this town has changed. It, the, the, the reason I keep references is because, and you, and, and you brought it up, so I'll just hammer that point. The last town manager was here for 30 years plus. He put it in his town report three different times that I'm aware of. Um, and there was no action, no discussion at town meeting, no, no desire to bring it up for this very reason. So I get it, but when you say that the transfer of property, um, you, you reference one thing that the, the UDAG loan right now is controlled by EFUD, correct? Sure. The, correct. The, the transfer <coughs> wasn't approved. It was put on the ballot, but it was voted down. Yeah, yeah. That's a loan. And, and it, yeah, and I understand why. <laughs> but 
I would also just say Bill Sheffleck also put in his report that EFA definitely desperately needs new commissioners. So if you're a resident of EFA and interested in this discussion, I would encourage you to run. Right now, I I recognize that, and I would encourage you to recruit, support, and endorse candidates who you think share and would further that view, so we can work with them. So you're saying that the the people that decide whether EFUD exists for the EFUD board. There's certainly a partner at the table, as I have said, and so certainly respecting their fellow board. They're the ones that decide. They're part of the conversation. So I, as a select board member, am not having this conversation without talking with them. So I would encourage you, like you well, said, I you're going to go to the and meeting and, and, and talk I with them. And will ask this question at their annual meeting, to which 41 people voted, OK? So I understand that. My, my, again, I'm not trying to be the jerk, right? All I'm trying to say is if this is a plan to go back to a town, he will be we the town. We are a town, currently. Well, I mean, this is We are a town. We don't have a charter. We are the town of water. Right? Many okay. towns in the state do not have a charter. OK, OK. So we'll play the semantics game. You are the town manager, right? Not the municipal manager. I'm the municipal manager. I also am the Okay. okay, I I rest my case. It's probably poorly made. Thank you. All right. Uh, anything else to say before Tom continues? And, and if it's small, I'd ask you to drive Alyssa. So I just want to show some history. All this data is on the state tax department's website. Um, we broke it down by category. Uh, this is 2022 versus 2004. So in 2022, we would have collected almost. 31,000 in alcohol taxes, um, poking at 80 grand for rooms, a little over 130 for meals, and then general retail sales, 360. So 600,000 in total. Um, and then I just put the growth in those categories since 2004. Um, inflation since 2004 is 2.65%. So all those categories are well above inflation. Any guesses on our, on our taxes? Not our rate, but how much our taxes have grown? <laughs> on average, we're five percent. The rate's lower, um, and it's hard to compare a rate from 2004 since we had a town and a village. Um, but five percent. So we could, in theory, tie ourselves to a future revenue source that's grown a little faster than uh, what we've taken from from town taxpayers, uh, which I think would be a very good thing. Um, just move on real quick. Oh. Oh, no. Page down. Okay. These are just some, some forecasts. Um, 2025 is the first realistic year, and I'll get to a timeline later, but if this is passed locally this fall, the legislature has to approve it. That takes time. The governor has to sign the bill. The tax department needs two quarters to implement it. So. Maybe in my wildest dreams, this could happen in the fourth quarter of 2024, but I think the first quarter of 2025 is realistic, which really means the state collects it, takes our time to process it. We would see revenue in May of 2025, but we could budget, if it's passed, we could budget in 2025 with this revenue in mind. Um, but a little forecasting um, and showing our tax rate. If all those categories I showed on the previous slide grew at 50% their historical rate, which is a pretty conservative assumption, um, we're actually almost $650,000 in 2025. And that, um, based on today's tax rate, today's taxes we levy, um, is over $0.08. Cents. Um, I've gotten a number of people who have called me and said, well, are you, are you promising an $0.08 cents tax cut? And my answer is no, certainly not. Um, I can get into some pressures later. Um, what I'm suggesting is this gave us some ability to control our increases taxes at a rate lower than 5%. Um, but tax cut, that's, a, I think, a massive overpromise at this stage. Another big question I've had is, is how much of this is paid by Taurus? And I have spent a long time scouring the earth for data about this, and I can find none. Um, what I think is an interesting data point, if I took that 8.26 cents and, and applied it to your home, um, so 
almost 250 bucks is is how it would how it would equate to if it was pure property taxes um, and when I think about that I think how much would you have to spend uh, to spend that much in retail sales taxes and if your calculating are just our one percent of course it's twenty four thousand seven hundred eighty dollars um, so I think you're getting a bigger bang for your buck um, I've, I've worked real hard to try to find something even anecdotal that I could say you know X percentage of, of non-residents or tourists pay this, and, and the data is just not out there to my knowledge. Um. I think if you looked at the, the uh, traffic and count the out-of-state you could, and, and you know, maybe a downtown business owner could tell me that the zip codes of their credit card receipts, something like that, but I don't have anything there actually was a study done hard for you to make. That was like Wanberry did it um, during COVID. It, no, no, no. This um, before it was, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's old. It's yeah. it's the one where we got our branding from um, oh, that study. Yeah. Okay. And they did it. They did a zip code. They did do a you know a time. I mean, it would give you some sense. Yeah. Uh, although I, I think that um, you know the it, it it broke it down by um, town, by region, uh, by county, and then state and out of state. I think. Yeah. Karen could probably get that for you. Oh yeah, Alyssa um, probably not <laughs> So when we look at our budget today, we are substantially funded by property taxes. Outside of property taxes, um, actually our next biggest source of revenue comes from the state uh, through pilot payments for state land and, and, and their buildings on, our, on, on property in town. Um, and after that, you get down to fairly small revenue sources in the grand scheme of things. After the state pilot payments, uh, actually our, our fire contract um, to the fire chief is our next big revenue source. Um, so this gives us pretty substantial diversification. Um, and then there's all the old adages we've heard about property taxes, which is it's a regressive tax, it's not income sensitive. And so the local option tax um, is substantially income sensitive and is substantially voluntary. Um, so I think it's good that we could decouple ourselves to some extent from a completely involuntary non-income sensitive tax to at least bring it to some level back to the consumer and their ability and desire to pay. Um, some people have asked me about other towns that have done this and, and, and behavioral changes. There's some concern that you know, if we add another 1%, people won't shop here. Um, I think as I slowed in, in the first slide, all of our competitors already had this. I think that was a really valid thing to, to bring up in, in 1995 when you were the first town to do this somewhere. Um, or if you were imposing a 5% tax, I think it's really valid. But I think given where we are in today's economy, um, I think it actually puts us at a competitive disadvantage to not have it. Um, The, uh, the, the select board was given a draft policy on how we'd, how we'd utilize it, and the thought on that was to, at some point, have a formal adopted policy to give our partners in the legislature some, some understanding of how to introduce the bill and, and how to talk about how we would utilize these. Um, but that policy was payment of existing debt, pay down our debt faster, um, spend it directly on capital expenses and substantially avoid debt. Um, we talked about economic development, community vitality. I would put, for instance, Stanley Wasson and, and some affordable housing investments in that economic development bucket. Um, and we talked about some investments that generate long-term savings, um, whatever that may be. Um, oftentimes, uh, in the local government world, that's technology um, to help you save on some labor. <laughs> and then I've had a number of questions from people. Um, you know, why do you need the 600,000? Um, what are your challenges? And the answer is there's a lot. Um, Stanley Watson site is a simple example. Um, the town at some point will soon, I hope, will be given an option by the state to buy that property, but it's not going to be free. The state has an obligation to, to sell us that property, in essence, at the market value. Um, so the town hopefully can, can partner and enter into an agreement to develop that site and get our investment back, but uh, there's likely costs along the way. Uh, the second thing is we're subject to all the same inflation costs that everyone else is. 
Our paving budget is $405,000 this year. It's the same amount as last year. It's the same amount as the year before that. Price a ton of asphalt, it's up 40% in three years. So our paving budget really isn't level or close to it. So would I love to have a million dollar paving budget? I would. Um, I think a lot of people would. Uh, the fire chief is here. He's got a 20 year capital plan and in a couple of years, three years, um, he's, got, he's got three 17 year old vehicles now so his hope is to replace those. Now he's, he's really good at looking at the vehicles and, and if we can string them along another year or two, we will, but those two vehicles, if we bought them today, are poking out a half million bucks. I think if we have to buy them in 2026 or 2027, it's gonna be 600 easy. Yes, and, and there's, on top of that, a delay. Um, when you order, uh, as an example, an engine or a pump truck, it's almost three years from the time you order it till you get it. That's how far back logged they are. Other, item, other trucks are less time. Tank trucks um, are significantly less time, less than half that amount of time. So when, you, when you're planning this, you have to like, all right, we need one in 2026. Do you need it in 2026? Because if that means you need it in 2026, you have to order it in 2023. So there's a lot of processes involved in identifying what it is that you need, what you can string along a little bit longer. And we've done that with both tank trucks. They're past the time that the plan initially said that we should replace them. But you have to look at when you can get them and when you should order them. And when you order them, you've got to be able to have access to money. So it's, it's not as easy as any of us going to a local car dealership and saying, um, I'd like that truck or that, that car. Uh, there, we, we've certainly strung along some of our vehicles and, and they've, they've been good vehicles, but at some point you pay the piper. Gary, do we have an order in? Uh, yeah, so we have currently, um, as long as everything goes through with, with the budgets, a tank truck next year that was ordered already this year. We didn't order it. The vendor ordered it as a demo truck that we're going to buy potentially from him. And he's already ordered another one for the following year that I would certainly recommend we purchase that one as well. Um, they have been good trucks. It's been a great vendor. They take care of the, the apparatus. But again, you have to think out that far ahead and jump ahead of every other uh, fire department in the state of Vermont and this side of uh, New York. So. And the same applies to F-550s for public works. Same challenge, it's not quite as long as time, but uh, the cost of inflation on big trucks has been really substantial the last few years. Um, feels like it's leveling off a little bit, but it's, 30-ish percent over the last three years from, from what I've gathered. Um, Chris might have bought one himself and, and seen that. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask Gary real quick, how is it you managed to step in front of all these other municipalities <laughs> and get first dibs on these? On it's, these it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a inside connection. It's a secret that I am not willing to, <laughs> to disclose. We have a really good relationship with the vendor we have purchased a number of vehicles from him, and he gives us, really, because we purchased so many vehicles from him, he gives us first right of refusal. So it's it's a good end. Um, and I've already told Bill Woodruff that we're planning on buying a fire truck in next year's budget, so if he wants a piece of heavy equipment, he can have it. It's gotta be at least the cost of the fire truck or less, and he's gotta get Gary to to stop the order. <laughs> so those two can fight it out. Um, and then just a few other items. Policing is, is uncertain. Um, I think that's the best way to put it. That's fair. Um, police departments are struggling to hire the state police aren't immune from that. Um, and we might want to, at some point, increase our services. We're paying $400,000 a year now for two troopers, but if this town desired an increased presence, call it $200,000 per officer. It's not a, not a free service. Um, and then we might have noticed we just had a flood. Um, Roger earlier mentioned Harvey's Field and, and, and that work. 
um, 10 years ago that that mitigation project was pegged at 3.2 million we can safely assume it's doubled um, even if the state and federal typically on large infrastructure projects you can find state and federal partners typically you can't find them until you've paid for the engineering locally um, Rough numbers, most large construction projects, engineering is 10%. Um, so there could be a, well, an investment over a half a million dollars um, on one flood mitigation project just to get it to the construction stage, never mind the construction cost. Um, so I mentioned earlier I've gotten phone calls about people saying, well, will you cut taxes because of this? Um, I think we can have some, some stabilization um, I think we can manage the rate and its growth upward, but no, even if we had this today, I think some of these priorities um, are thrown into the mix in a pretty big way. And I think that's just the reality of, of where we are as a town and, and where the state is and where some of these inflationary pressures are impacting us. Tom, may I for just a moment? On the last slide. Sure. Oh, wait. Last slide. Oh, wait. <coughs> Never mind. The top of the last that yeah, the top of the last slide is affordable housing. <laughs> oh, I'm, breaking. I'm breaking. I'm breaking. The top of the last slide is affordable <laughs> housing. Yes, that is absolutely an issue for this town. Um, a vast population of our town are tipped wage employees. When you pay your bill at a restaurant or a coffee shop, you tip on the bill total, including tax. <laughs> well, so when you tip, it says here's your total and tip on your total. Should be, right? But that's an extra 1% when most people tip 20%, right? If you're not an asshole. Um, uh, um, anyway, it raises folks' salary, annual salaries, which helps afford housing especially in a town where housing is so expensive. So yes, this is a huge benefit to the town having this tax, but it will be a benefit to tipped wage employees who make up a vast portion of our restaurant sector. Yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Katia D'Angelo, 16 yes. Street. Um, I think there are two towns that have rescinded local option taxes or parts of one, I know it was Killington, but I just looked it up. Um, and they rescinded the sales tax portion, and I forget what the other one was, but I think it was in a big list. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on why, or if you know why they had it for so many years and then decided to tax it. I'm not aware of their story or when they did it. Um, it's just one. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I can speculate that their grand list is growing pretty dramatically, and they may not need it. Um, and if you're if you're a town that you know that the the major employer in that town could well feel that one percent um, in a different way than than an entire town would. I, that's just my speculation. I'm yeah, not. No, it, it was an outlier in the list, and I thought that was a. <laughs> it looks like they rescinded it before they actually implemented it. Oh, really? Oh, no, sorry. 18, 2007 when they had it in effect for about 10 years. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I, I missed the one. It's interesting that you raised Killington because Killington um, is in the midst of a huge infrastructure project involving what's called tax increment financing, which lets them tap into the Ed Fund. Um, and so they, they've got a, a huge financing source way above the 600 grand per year. Um, that which, a, that is <laughs> mm -hmm. which, which may also have been their plan all along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, just uh, to be clear though, because throwing the 600K makes everybody really excited, right? But the mechanics of that is we don't get that money, right? That money goes to the state, then it so, gets apportioned, correct? The state pays thirty percent. I've accounted for that when showing that okay. data already. So the so the interesting thing is that thirty percent goes into a fund. That goes to other towns. 
that goes to every town. Right. So when Stowe enacted their 1%, we'll see a cut. So looking at, at data from the last few years, the state apportions, they call it the pilot payment, which is funded by that 30% of the 1%. The state apportions that, they take all the revenue and it's based on the insurance value of their buildings. So we're about 15%, um, sorry. Our local option tax in different part of our budget would yield us about $15,000 if nothing changed. Um, I don't know what Stowe is estimating there is gonna bring, um, but as more towns do this, we actually we actually grow in that area of our budget too. Tom? Um, so to be clear, I, I, one of your following slides was what the process is, but if we have a charter that allows us to off to have a local option tax, do we still have to apply to the state for permission? I mean, when the, when the local option tax was first instituted, it was only available to six municipalities or whatever, and over time, it's been opened up to everybody who goes through this approval process. But do we, would we still have to apply to the, for the, the ability to do this, and at which point we decide whether it's all the taxes that you just listed or whether it's just alcohol or just sales? Um, so if it's passed locally, the, the town clerk um, would give would give the local approvals to the Secretary of State. The bills would go through government operations committees um, in both the House and Senate. So that's the process I understand that there's no formal ask on, um, on our part. Um, and of course the, the legislature can say no, or the legis legislature can say no to a portion of it. Um, so the, the short version um, of this slide is once we're certain on our charter language, um, step one is schedule a public hearing, 70 days in advance of the vote. Karen is not here, but she would have to reach out to the school and find an appropriate day for a vote. Um, but 70 days from today puts us at the end of October. Um, the vote has to be Australian ballot at a special town meeting. Um, and along the way, there's a couple public hearings too. But the critical, the critical days to think about are 70 days from today. So, if this were to be approved locally and, and brought to the legislature for their next session, time is of the essence. Um, and that's that's my presentation. Uh, Chris, thanks for your, you know explanation of all this and uh, I got to tell you I'm internally inside of myself I'm more concerned about the overall concerning bigger picture of this thing yeah it's nice to think about six hundred thousand dollars but as you talk about forty percent increase in <coughs> asphalt costs fire vehicles that are beyond reason, in my opinion, of expense. And inflationary costs across the board, and then Kane speaks about affordable housing. I'm gonna tell you that there's a lot more ri people at risk in that affordable category than you think, mm -hmm. because as time goes on, and we're being outpaced by the expense of doing business, you know, there's more at threat for a lot more of us here than I think people realize moving forward. And I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, Chris. Um, I, I don't have any big answers either, but uh, what I see is that we're worse off if we don't do this. Mm -hmm. um, and so that while this isn't it's not going to solve all of those issues that Tom had up there, but uh, it is uh, a step in that direction in terms of uh, helping us think about think about those items and and prioritize. I mean, you know, all of us need to prioritize whether it's in our personal finances, the state's finances, or the town's finances. So, uh, but I, I find us worse off if we don't do this and. Um, I, I, for one, have uh, been anxious about not getting on this bandwagon, frankly, um, and now we have uh, something like 
25 towns, something like that. Um, and uh, there, have, there have been some rumors floating around the Ways and Means Committee about closing this ability to do this. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think time is of the essence. Um, so, and, and we get a double benefit, you know, so the, that 30% goes in to fund the pilot payments and we get a big chunk of money from pilot. So we not only get the, you know, whatever amount it would be, but we also get the amount that it will increase the pilot coming back to us. So it seem, it really seems um, like something that, you know, at this point in time in our history and, and where we are right now, I think it's a must do. And uh, Teresa, in your experience, is there anything else the town should be doing in order to uh, facilitate this, uh, the passage of this uh, within the legislature? Um, the one question that I have, and I, I think, um, you know, we can talk to uh, Tucker, who's the attorney who would be looking at this. Um, my recollection of the ones that we've passed in recent history, they've said what they are going to be used for. Mm -hmm. um, and so there may need to be some statement in that charter that I don't think we need to like tie it down as specific as some of the other folks have, but we may need a statement in there about what it would be used for. So we um, had a draft policy at the select board, um, but I... I mean, that's fairly generic. Yeah. That's fairly generic. Yeah, which, um, would, which would, I mean, you want, in my estimation, you want to leave yourself as much um, flexibility as possible. Right. What, I, what I don't recommend is, is putting in the actual charter what it's used for, because you cannot change those categories without changing your charter. But if it was a select board policy, the select board can make that decision. The voters can make that decision every time right. they vote in a budget. But you might need a statement in there that says the select board shall draft a policy or in accordance mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. okay. yep. uh, yeah. policy set by the select board, something like that. Sure. That that's on the same way tonight because that was that was my concern. I don't have children. I eat out a lot. I spend my money around town. Um, some of the things that the money might be spent on are not gonna be beneficial to me. So my, do, are you guys obviously gonna come up with a process of how you're gonna allocate or prioritize that money? And will the voters have a chance to weigh in on how we utilize that money? Yes, the voters can weigh in at budget time. Okay. In the same way, um, at town meeting. a town meeting day, voters made, uh, there were motions to made to, to reduce, I believe, what was um, an ARPA allocation to downstreet housing. Yes. Um, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, so, but see, that's the thing. So, I, what I'm trying to say is, I know that we have issues, and there's everybody has their own things that they think are important. But you have to remember that all of us are taxpayers in this town who go out and spend money. So, like, if you're going to spend it on building a skate park. I'm not going there. But if you're going to do a, a park where they're skating and maybe something else, <coughs> hey, great. You know, that's going to be a benefit to me. So I would appreciate having the ability as a voter to look at how we're going to prioritize and allocate that money. So one way I think of this tax is it's not a $600,000. Um, a number to keep in your head is $9 million. Um, if the town at the interest rates we can borrow, if the town issued $9 million in debt today, $600,000 would be the annual debt service. Um, towns that have a local option tax frequently have items at their town meeting, and it says in the warning, shall the town pave this road or buy this and service the debt with a local option tax? And, and that's part of how I envision this would be used in the future, and that's how most towns tend to, tend to phrase it. So it'd be, It'd be a way to, you know, for Gary to have a truck without impacting your tax rate, in theory. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> so what you're telling me, Tom, is that money just isn't going to go into the general fund? No. As, no. as a no. revenue source, it's a, it's a separate line item that will be specific to certain expenditures? What I'm saying is that 
Um, it's a new revenue source, and I think we clearly want to highlight how we spend that in the same way we're highlighting the ARPA funds. So I think every year we pretty clearly outline in the budget what the local option taxes are used for. Um, and it may be that some years the budget doesn't include use of all of it, and that we're, we may make a decision to, to build. Um, the town of St. Albans, for example, had a long-term plan to, to build a new town hall, and they, they saved their local option tax for years, um, and they wound up building a uh, they built, sorry, public works garage, but they're essentially building a public works garage in a town hall and paying cash because they saved for a decade. Um, so it it opens up opportunities. Tom, you have your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for having this meeting. Thank you to the select board for considering this finally. Um, my memory of, of the reason it's been expanded to so many towns is that it's clearly a tool that each of the municipalities can use. The state's interest is that it's not abused, um, that it's not just to lower your school tax rate, which it may do through investment, but not just to, to lower your tax rate locally. And the things that we can do with the money, um, if, if in fact we, the state decides to get rid of this tool, it will raise its sales tax anyway at some point in the future, and we won't see the benefit like we can see it here. And so I'm just, it's something for us to seriously consider. I think it's not so much the legislature we have to worry about now, it's the low, passing it locally. Um, I don't think it's as, I don't think it's as um, hot a topic. I think people will see it as, as a clear benefit because so many other municipalities are seeing it, but you know, having a clear vision that we can take, you know, your representatives and senators can take to the state house will help a great deal. Um, there's nothing we can't predict inflation. We can't predict gasoline going up 50 cents a gallon, um, you know, which hurts us in the immediate, as opposed to something like this where. Um, it's it's an it's an accumulation. So thank you for for putting it forward. You've made it seem reasonable, um, and it makes perfect sense for us to try to figure out the best way to um, put it. The biggest thing is that this is a charter, um, and what we end up doing with that charter over time. If you create the foundation now, that's solid, then um, we'll be able to use that tool as well in the future. So again, appreciation for, for what you've put forward so far. Yeah. Any further comments on this? Well, thank you all for your input. Very much appreciated. Okay. Next on the agenda, we have a uh, review of the uh, quarter financials. Yeah, yeah we're, we're just as Just as hot button. <laughs> We're way over. I gave big raises to everyone, so. Way <laughs> on. Had to throw that out. There. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank just, you. Just so you're aware, Tom, there's. I know what there's, there's, there's two ways for the EFUD dissolution to start. The first is the EFUD board votes to pursue it themselves. The second is there's a petition brought forth by the legal voters of Utah to get it on the ballot. Thank you. <laughs> Helpful information. <laughs> um, uh, finances, um, second quarter, although the... Oh, sorry. It's still recording. It's still on Zoom. I don't know why it's not. I have to unshare the screen. Why don't I just help this? Oh. All right. Um, the, the big presentation will be the third quarter because we, um, second quarter, we're not substantially through the summer with recreation. Um, mm -hmm. We have most of our payroll expenses, most of the revenues. And we've barely started um, the paving. In fact, most of our paving is going to occur in the next three weeks. 
Um, so the third quarter numbers will be far more consequential. Is uh, uh, is that where we already are with paving? The four hundred and five thousand. That's the budget. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's the whole sure. budget. That's not where we are. Uh, yeah. Oh, I see where we're at. Actual okay. Q2 is yeah, where yeah. we are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So taxes will also show in the third quarter because um, we don't uh, send those bills out um, until after July 1st. Um, so taxes are minimal. What you're seeing for taxes are just extra penalties so far for the year, really in last year's balances that were due. Something I will um, just bring to you as a suggestion in the future soon is a tax sale um, on delinquent balances. I was going to bring that forth before you um, in July and then the flood happened. Mm -hmm. But it's something unpleasant, but you have to do every so often. Mm -hmm. um, other governmental revenue um, is um, Dr. Perry Fire Contract and is, is revenue um, from the state um, for the state lands for the pilot payment. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all I expect going to be fine. Um, the, the pilot payment for the state lands, we know in advance, so we can budget the exact amount. The pilot payment for the buildings, um, we budgeted a really conservative number. Um, we don't have the money yet, but I've got notification and we'll be about $35,000 to the good there. Mm -hmm. Part of that is because some towns have new local option taxes. <laughs> <laughs> um, service fee is a, about half of that um, budget would be recreation. Um, and the summer rec program um, really is about $150,000 in revenue, so it's a pretty big, pretty big amount um, in total. Um, and miscellaneous um, is ARPA. So that's been allocated, but, but very little of that has been spent. Um, I did make the transfer to EFUD, um, and the senior center did receive their, uh, they sent a bill in for uh, 10,000, I think 10,550 for their kitchen work. Um, that was approved. And I think that was up to 11,000. Um, so uh, so you reflected in Q3? <laughs> uh, that's in there now. That was in June. And they've got some left to spend. That's good. Yeah. Um, <coughs> they, they cut off their contact with me. I haven't heard from them in months. Okay. <laughs> okay. I gave them a bunch of recommendations on equipment, and then I never heard from them again. They got what they needed. Yeah, hopefully. Okay. Um, general government expenses. We are, for the first half of the year, a little over on payroll and fringe, but we had uh, two managers. Um, sorry, we had we didn't have two managers. We had Bill Shekelek had a few months worth of, of fringe yeah. salary about to pay out from vacation, things like that. Um, something I'm learning this year is we'll probably have to go up a little bit. Um, I've really learned that if Karen is out, we really need Beth mm. full time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we budgeted for some of that. Um, she's part time. Thank you. She's she's 20 hours a week. So she oh, stepped up when Karen is out. Okay. Um, but it's it's a small enough office that one person being out has a has a big mm -hmm. impact. So I'm probably going to yeah. suggest the next year's budget a little more hours uh, in that regard for. <laughs> Yeah. Not full time, but I think just more hours when Karen's out. Um, on the fringe side, um, we're I think we're fine. Um, fringe, we we don't have exact rates now, but but it sounds like we're looking at you know twelve to fifteen percent on the health premium side that we'll have to deal with. Um, I'm working pretty hard to consider some options for employees that. Um, might change how healthcare works for them. Mm. I, I'm not sure I can find a win-win related to that. In fact, I'm pretty sure I can't find a win-win. One of the challenges, and um, I, we've got employees who are in here and they're on a high deductible plan and they haven't spent a nickel in healthcare for three or four years. So from their perspective, hey, I've got 20 plus thousand in my health savings account. Why would I want to change anything? And we've got other employees who spend that deductible every year. And, and that's to a large extent the nature of health care you pay as you need it. What you need, right? Um, I've wondered if there's some way to um, put a cap on total expenses based on the ability to pay. And I've got a different ability to pay than, than someone in the highway department. Mm -hmm. um, that'd be a pretty major change. Um, 
wouldn't impact me would, as, as the highest paid employee in the town, but could in theory impact some others. Um, I'm not sure I can find a way to make that work. Um, I might engage and spend a little bit of money on a consultant. Is it, yeah, is it being done ways. elsewhere? Do you know of any other? <coughs> Everyone slices and dices yeah. it a little differently. Uh, and the challenge you have is you have a few employees who say, you know, they get the out-of-pocket knocks sort of as a guarantee of yeah. your prescription drugs, things like mm -hmm. that. Um, and I, I get it if you're, if you're spending five or six thousand dollars in healthcare, which is a pretty normal amount in today's economy. Um, it's different if you make a hundred versus fifty. Um, so I, again, I don't know that I can, I can promise anything different. Um, just trying to, trying to figure it out, trying to talk to employees about it, see if there's a way um, to get there. And then it's also very interesting because a lot of our neighboring towns have very different compensation package. Some towns um, around us have substantially lower wages but free health insurance. Mm -hmm. For some employees, they just, it's not necessarily about the money because the total package isn't different. It's about the hassle of not having to worry about your health insurance mm -hmm. um, and plan for it. So again, I'm not sure I can promise anything. I'm just actively working on it. Um, but it, it's the health insurance premium world and, and if I figure out how to game it, I'll be the world's greatest genius, I think, and so I'm probably going to figure out how to game it, right? The world's <laughs> greatest genius. <laughs> I'll make you a name tag. Yeah. <laughs> so ARPA, we spent uh, we spent one hundred fifty thousand on EFUD, um, and we spent the uh, ten thousand five hundred fifty one on the senior center. Um, we have started to spend money on the bridges, um, but that will be a third quarter, um, and that'll go real quick um, once those invoices are in. Um, compared to last year, there's a there's a big difference in what we've spent on public safety so far. Um, in lieu of the, the ambulance service and trying to get that project off the ground, we have an annual amount we pay them. Last year we paid it in the third quarter. I accelerated a little mm -hmm. bit, so it's not a budget to actual difference. I spit up the cash because mm -hmm. trying to help them out and make sure they've got funds to advance that project. Um, <coughs> fire looks fine. Everything is on pace compared to uh, last year. Um, Landfill green up day, we, we have in essence spent the budget, but that's one payment to the to the Mad River uh, district. Uh, we paid that last year, uh, a few weeks later. Um, health and social service, a small amount budgeted there. We're gonna start to see some expenses um, because that's where the dog control officer is. Um, so so that's essentially just, just wages. Um, we might, um, at some point, incur some expenses if we've got a kennel or dog. Haven't had to do that yet. Hopefully, we won't, but that can get pretty expensive. Um, <coughs> parks maintenance. Um, a good chunk of that is staff time. During the summer, we have public works employees that, that technically move into parks, and so that's where we budget their uh, their salary and fringe. Um, but we're we're generally okay on on parks capital expenses. Um, we had some some damage to the um, to the uh, soccer field at the ice center. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to try to try to get that done and, and figure it out. But there's it's covered in silt in some places. It's it's five or six inches. Um, I'm not an expert on the silt. It's pretty soft stuff when you walk into it. Of course, it's super wet. Um, needs some grading. I think we can do that with our staff and, and with a smaller tractor we have. I don't think we need to use heavy equipment. Um, and I think that's FEMA reimbursable at 75%. Um, the challenge there is Capital Soccer, um, who has a lease on that mm -hmm. field, um, understandably wants it done yesterday because they want to replant and not have a mud pit in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, it's a priority to me to get that field done. It's a bigger priority to get our paving projects done. So, Can we move them to Hope Davy temporarily? <coughs> There's more demand for soccer fields in the spring than we have fields. Gotcha. Um, okay. So we'll figure something out and try to get it done. But it's going to be a, bit, a little bit of a challenge, and I think it, I think in our wildest dreams, it's not going to be a great field next spring. Hopefully, it'll be a playable field. Right. <coughs> um, Does EFUD want to give us any of their uh, maintenance money? It's a good question. 
Uh, I'm not sure they want to, but it's a reasonable question to ask since we now own their properties, and so we took title to the properties without the reserve funds they created for those properties. Mm -hmm. And there's about $150,000 there. So I can follow up on that one. You can follow up on that one. <laughs> I implied otherwise when I was on a bit of a tear earlier, so why <laughs> I that's the intended use of those funds. Uh, planning and zoning were, um, were at a higher pace than last year, but the Hope Davies study was, was a big part of that. Um, and a substantial part of those funds are really budgeted for this year. Plus, we've got the SE group and their other work that we talked about earlier um, about, the, about the bylaws. Um, but I think the overall base budget is fine. There's a vacancy there, you say it. Mm -hmm. We've advertised, right? I think I saw. We've advertised. I have a second round interview this Thursday. There's some members of the planning commission and DRB. Um, so that's. Isn't this uh, SE group uh, work with the uh, planning commission grant funded? Yes. Okay. And is that reflected here, or how does that get uh, built um, into the budget? It's reflect the revenue is in in miscellaneous, I believe. Okay. Um, the other piece I, I want to say now, because I neglected to say earlier, with a vacancy, Neil is still staffing the DRB, which meets twice a month, and he's, and he's also staffing the Planning Commission, which meets now every week. Um, so I just want to make sure I give Neil appropriate credit for taking on all that extra work, because it's a fair amount of extra work, and it's a lot more late nights, and he's over there right now mm -hmm. with them. <coughs> Sort of threw his work life balance out the window. It, it, it hopefully not for much longer. Okay. Um, municipal building, that's the that's really just the debt we pay. Um, and we pay that when it's billed to us, but it's a hundred grand a year, uh, the town's portion, and then the library pays a, another chunk of that. Um, and special articles, um, those are typically not paid until year end. If they request the funds, uh, we'll we'll give it to them. Um, but typically we wait until there are requests, which, and if there's no request, then we pay it all right at the year end. Uh, but you do pay it if we it's do not pay requested. It. Okay. We do pay it until they're approved. Yeah, no. Um, and it's essentially a legal obligation at that point. Oh, yeah, so no, I understand. Right. I just I, the question of your organization's note request, I guess, the savvy ones. So. I want to move on to highway. Um, And all their revenue essentially comes through taxes, which we didn't bill in the second quarter. Um, and the all else is, is fairly minor. Um, so really, in highway, it's a matter of it's a matter of salary and fringe and, and the other expenses. Um, but our payroll looks fine. Um, overtime's a big chunk, and that's that's front loaded and back loaded in the year for the for the winter. Um, in the third quarter, that'll that'll include some some little bit higher numbers, but that's also FEMA reimbursable for all the work they did related to the flood. Um, fuel is actually um, in a good place compared to last year. Prices are we budgeted more, and prices are a little bit down. Um, salt, we are essentially at budget, but we've got a full shed, so we're we're hopeful that we can um, we can survive on our budget for the year. We didn't. Really pinch it tight. Forty-five thousand was in line with your expectations, but your salt budget has plus or minus twenty-five percent depending on the winter. Um, and we we have in our parking lot reducing salt usage that will be on the agenda at some point before the snow floods. Yeah. Um, anticipate anticipate my question. <laughs> Uh, chloride, sand, stone, and gravel, and I put chloride in because we, we spread it on the roads and we grade, so it's a, sort of a part of the gravel road maintenance. Um, <coughs> sand, we, um, we've got a huge stockpile of sand, um, and we keep, we keep buying that. Um, when it's a really rainy day and we can't do much else, the crew goes and hauls sand. Um, so the local pit is still open for sand for this year only, um, but it's only open half the day. Um, mm -hmm. But we always we always try to go into the winter with three thousand yards of sand, and we're, getting, we're poking at that now. It, is in, it seems like there's some indication that they will both be closed down completely, right? They will close down completely after this year. Right. And I've done some some estimates of all the various aggregates we purchase: sand and crushed stone and, and various gravels and. 
it's hard to it's hard to know exactly what it's going to cost us because if we contract out to, for someone to rebuild a thousand foot of road, it's all in their bid. But in a normal year, and of course there's a lot of variation. The best I can tell is is that pit closing, increased labor travel costs, hits us fifty to sixty thousand hmm. dollars. So that'll impact us next year. Not nothing. Not nothing. Is there? Are we? Sorry. No, no, no. You can go first. Go ahead. Thank you. Are we, um, you said we're almost at that 300000 Are we thinking about, or do, or do we have capacity to overstock in the future? A little bit, um, but not much. And it's yeah. mostly near the ice center. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and they've been um, non committal, and I've asked that question can we overbuy if other towns don't use their allocation? They haven't got an answer yet. Um, <coughs> vehicle and equipment repairs, um, we are headed towards towards a shortfall there. We budgeted more than prior years when we don't have a mechanic. Um, most of our vehicles are newer and have warranties for the major things, um, but we still got some older vehicles and we had some pretty substantial bills. Um, and, and it's sort of been luck of the draw for the first half of the year. Um, so we'll have to look at that closely in 2024. Are you going to continue to look for a mechanic? I don't think so. We might want to add a position, a general position, but um, you know, with, with the warranties that we have, um, we don't have an old fleet in general, um, and the complexities. The, the mechanic, um, I think has a less of an impact in public works, and I've come to think of it as a bigger impact on fire because the mechanic works on all their pumps and maintain those things. They've got um, some good staff there. Um, Cal Gayette is a great example, and, and Kenny Ryan, they're in, water, they're in the water. They work on things like pumps all the time, so they can help fire service some of those things. Mm -hmm. they, they work <coughs> for the a water department, but they're up all, all the volunteer fire department. The challenge is, even if they can maintain it, sometimes to maintain your warranty and your certifications, it's got to be a professional with a license who puts oh. their stamp on it. And they don't have the qualifications for it? Right. Um, so yeah, we are feeling the mechanic. Um, you need a I, diesel tech? I just don't think we can hire a mechanic for anywhere near what we, um, what we can afford. And the reality is we need that diesel tech. 10, 25 percent of the time. The rest of the time, they're they're a regular employee. Mm -hmm. um, but then we're paying them substantially more than everyone else, and creating mm -hmm. inequities. This might sound really dumb, but <coughs> when I was in technical school, the local fire department contracted with the technical school mm -hmm. to to do diesel work on the fire trucks. Is that something we could explore? Yeah. And I think we're open to any idea. Yeah. I seem to remember that happening. Yeah, let me check with Gary. So, tech uh, at Harvard any longer, I believe. No, central Vermont, technical. Yeah. Yeah. And we have a rep. We have a town rep. I don't know who it is. There might be a good connection. Might be something we're looking into. You hope it doesn't save us any money in the end if it helps the kids and 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 we break even, do just as well. That's a win. So we can look. To that. Um, and then in highway, there's a there's a big transfer to the capital fund, which is just internal money moving around. Um, but I'm, I don't make that transfer until the capital funds are for your expenses. But it doesn't impact our cash. It's just we're moving it from from one accounting bucket to the other. Um, library, which is um, you know five hundred fifty thousand dollar expense item, um, they're on budget. They're they're doing fine on payroll, which is which is most of what they have, and then they have the municipal building, and they pay their portion of it, and that's that's fine too. Um, so so no red flags at the library. Um, sometimes turnovers are helpful in that you get those vacancy savings, and they've had they've had some of that. Um, that being said, I do think um, you know we've required the library for some years to to live a little bit off their reserves. Um, that hurt us in 2022 because their reserves, which is their investment fund, also took a loss. Mm -hmm. So it's recovered this year, but it'd be nice to wean them off of that in the budget process if we can afford it. Because um, you sort of take a double whammy when you're pulling from their fund and mm -hmm. your fund's losing money. 
um, be nice to somehow just decouple that. Um, and then moving on to just the last page. Um, <coughs> cemetery um, is zero. Nobody died. <coughs> no property taxes yet. No. <laughs> That'll come in. Um, all the other revenues, um, so the all else is substantially their own investment fund, which is about a half million dollars. So their investment fund is, is done well and will we'll benefit from that. Um, last year it was deeply in the red at this time. Mm -hmm. So another example where it would be nice to not budget any gain or gain from the investment fund because it's, it's pretty ephemeral. Um, <coughs> On the salary and the fringe, we sort of a surplus. We've talked about a cemetery position that we haven't filled yet. Uh, we didn't need much of an effort. Um, grounds maintenance um, that we're in, but we're, oh, we're well over last year, but we budgeted a lot more because we had a, we had a guy who took care of Lope Cemetery for years and never raised his price, and now we're subject to the market, which is essentially 2,000 bucks for a mow and trim of Hope Cemetery. Mm -hmm. And every contractor in the area was reached out to bid on that one. It's a lot of, it's just a lot of work. There's a lot of gravestones. Um, you can't it's, exactly. it's, it's hours and hours of trimming and, and push mowing because you, yeah. Yeah, it's just how it's laid out. Um, the other piece, and it won't be reflected here yet, but um, the cemetery um, is doing a couple other sort of upgrades. Um, and they have pledged to me that if they are over budget, they will pull from their investment fund to cover any difference. And if they're comfortable with that, I am. <coughs> um, municipal building, that fund was created to really show uh, what it costs to run this building. Substantial amount of that is really just servicing the debt, which doesn't go away for a long, long time. Um, we had some pretty serious struggles with the with the heating system and some building maintenance issues over the winter um, and even into the summer. We had a, a coolant leak, which sounds like a simple thing, but 15 grand later. Mm -hmm. um, so the building maintenance is pretty high. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll not struggle the second half when we've got that under control, but it just goes to show you how one little challenge um, can be a major issue. Did that get resolved? That's resolved, and everything is everything is is working and fine mm -hmm. uh, now. And, it, and what is odd because um, you know in the middle of the winter, yeah, heated over there but not here. Eight, Eighty-five over there, and we had to run space heaters to keep it above fifty-five and on our side on the other end. Um, mm -hmm. So my plan for next year is not to spend fifteen grand. I'll just kick Rachel out of her office. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. We're all set. <laughs> Move them into the offices over there. Books don't get heat. <laughs> Um, and then on the capital side, um, paving just started. Um, we've had some expenses um, that we'll, we'll really make up in budget for next year on the Stowe Street Bridge, the Fry Bridge, mm -hmm. um, which the state is advancing the engineering on. Um, and that's envisioned 2025-2026 um, to do the real work. Not the dry bridge then, <coughs> the bridge at the top of Stowe Street by 100, right? Sorry, yeah, okay. sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's again. not the track bridge. It's the, right. so many problems. So it's still a short little, a short little bridge. Um, sidewalks haven't spent a nickel yet as of this report, but they've been working on sidewalks heavily mm -hmm. the last few weeks. I saw that. Um, so some of that's grant funded to, as as one of the final final pieces for what wasn't finished last year, and that's Randall Street. Mm -hmm. um, but we've got our own small budget to do some work, and it's really going to be focused around school, uh, mm -hmm. just make the sidewalks a little better make it all more walkable. Um, Do you have uh, an updated uh, schedule for Randall Street? I know it's supposed to be in August, but I know you're behind due to flooding and other issues. I just talked about that this morning, but I, I forget the date. Mm -hmm. but I, it's imminent, because um, they're, they're pulling it all now and, and getting ready in other places. Mm -hmm. So I think it's end of August. Okay. And the updated dates for paving, um, They'll do it all at one time, but Howard Avenue needs a top coat. That's end of August, beginning of September. Then the Little River Road will follow right thereafter. Okay. All right. Good. <clears throat> um, the ARPA bridges have started now, um, and I've seen some bills now, but not of the second quarter. But that's the bridge in Armory Drive, and then the bridges on Guptill. Two bridges on Guptill, right? 
Uh, just one on ductile. Yeah. Oh, okay. There's one's worse <coughs> off than the other one. Yeah. The farther one. And then we, we had envisioned a pretty large gravel road project this year. We're still planning on that. That's um, always been thought of as something that's tackled after paving. And you can, you know, you can't pave in the fall, but you can rebuild the gravel road in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, and, and current thinking of Public Works is, is they actually, um, they want to hit the bottom of Sweet Road really hard. Mm -hmm. um, they feel like that was one of their worst areas this past year. And, and I've said to Bill Woodruff, um, you know, after half the winter here, I'm not in a great position to spar with you on that one. Mm -hmm. So if you if you think it's Sweet Road, I'm happy with Sweet Road. And if you think it's you know, some other road, I'm, I'm not going to argue either. Uh, uh -huh. <coughs> and that's something we can ask for the uh, the public to chime in and get some commentary on that. <laughs> I'm sure we'd have some. Uh, we just might. Um, <coughs> on that. Non facetiously, I am just going to interrupt now. This is off topic, but say I would we should do a section in the town report about what your ARPA projects were. I just feel like yeah. when, what you proposed for local option tax, where we really highlighted like we highlighted how the money was being spent, but then I'm thinking like having a picture of the finished sidewalk and reconstructed gravel road and bridges and just mm -hmm. highlighting like this is what the ARPA money was spent on, I think would be a good full circle. Just wanted to say that. Um. On the gravel study, we had a little bit of money budgeted. I did make a presentation to the state about about the the former quarry, um, which we want to reopen not as a quarry, but to clean up the detritus. Um, I'm waiting to hear from them. I did reach back out to them about next steps, and I'm essentially waiting on them. But they they talked about um, on the map. There's a stream that goes through that site. Um, in reality, I didn't find it. Um, it's likely a seasonal runoff stream. There is a, near where that site meets the road, um, there is a culvert, um, and there's, there's, a, there's runoffs on a seasonal basis, but they talked about some, some work and some understanding of that stream, and they actually thought that maybe there was a way to enhance it, sort of bring it back to its natural state, and so, I sort of envision this twenty thousand dollars as maybe a way to keep that conversation going and to offer some funds to kickstart that work if that's step one to making this a viable site. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> the loader, I put that in there. We didn't budget for one this year, but we budgeted last year and we incurred the expense this year. So those those funds sort of fell to the fund balance, and, and now we spend it this year. Um, we we. Uh, we did budget a new truck at 140, and we have an expense of 110. That is not this year's truck. That is.